Next, the hearing on humanitarian assistance to Iraq. Earlier today, Defense and State Department officials talked about the distribution of aid in Iraq and other countries following a military operation. Connecticut Congressman Chris Shays chaired the hearing held by a House government subcommittee. It's about four hours. The Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats and International Relations hearing entitled Humanitarian Assistance Following Military Operations Overcoming Barriers is called to order. In defense of international peace and human dignity, coalition armed forces have liberated Iraq from the death grip of a brutal, corrupt regime. They did so brilliantly and bravely, executing a battle plan that demanded unparalleled military precision and unprecedented efforts to minimize civilian casualties. That same concern for the long oppressed people of Iraq now motivates our efforts to stabilize that nation, bring relief to millions in need, and help them create a government they can trust and support. We cannot fail to complete this journey. The forces of liberation, military and civilian, are working to fill the vacuum created by the collapse of Saddam's insidious tyrannical control apparatus the same urgency that propelled armed columns into Baghdad must now drive efforts to establish civil order, restore basic services, and reopen safe passage for food, people, food, medicine, and necessities. During my very brief stay in Iraq last month, as the guest of Connecticut-based humanitarian organization Save the Children, I saw heart-wrenching poverty and unendurable living conditions. Not the war, but decades of Saddam's sadism and brutal selfishness robbed the Iraqi nation of the means and the capability to thrive. As liberators, the culminating, perhaps more difficult duty of regime change is to care for the people of Iraq until they are able to harvest the fruits of human dignity and freedom for themselves. The task is absolutely enormous. Before the war, 60 percent of the population relied solely on the United Nations Oil for Food program for basic needs. After the war, food warehouses were looted. Lack of clean water and reliable power are crippling an already inadequate health care system. In an oil-rich country, shortages of cooking fuels and other refined products inflame hardship and resentments. We cannot and should not expect to meet the challenge alone. International aid programs and non-government organizations referred to as NGOs have the most experience accessing humanitarian needs and getting essential supplies through logistic and political barriers. NGO staff are, li are willing to take risks but they cannot yet operate fully or freely in an unsettled security environment that threatens the physical safety and political neutrality of humanitarian workers. The transition from combat to police operations has not been as rapid or smooth as planned. Hard lessons learned in Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Haiti, and Afghanistan on the need to quell emergent lawlessness seems to have fallen out of the battle plan during the dash to Baghdad. The military mechanics of basic security and free-flowing humanitarian assistance need to be brought forward quickly before vicious thugs and radical mullahs can occupy the moral high ground so nobly gained in battle. The President charged the Pentagon's Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance with bringing civil order and much-needed aid to Iraq. Ambassador Paul Bremer and retired Army General Jay Garner are leading U.S. efforts to meet that challenge. We will hear a taped message from General Garner this, this morning, this afternoon, rather. We will also hear from federal agencies and NGOs directly involved in rebuilding Iraq. 
Their testimony will help us understand the difficulties of delivering assistance in post-war Iraq and the scope of humanitarian mission facing the world. With military might and precious lives, we have paved the way for peace and democracy in Iraq. For that struggling nation, that troubled region, and a changing world, the road ahead is perilous and the stakes are enormous. We cannot fail to complete the journey. This time, uh, the chair would recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Kucinich, for an opening statement. I want to thank the chair for his uh, dedicated efforts to try to obtain General Garner's testimony today. And I want to uh, state for the record that I'm concerned about the Defense Department's refusal to send uh, any department officials to this hearing so we can have our questions answered. Um, General Garner's testimony will be on videotape, and we're not going to have any opportunity to question him. Uh, I might add that uh, for the Department of Defense that this is a United States Congressional Oversight Subcommittee with responsibility for the Department of Defense. Uh, in my view, a videotape testimony is not acceptable. Um, this is not Emerald City, folks. And General Gar Garner is not the Wizard of Oz. I mean, we have an, an obligation to get answers to our questions. And it's also a great concern because the International Relations Committee is holding a hearing on Thursday in which uh, the general will testify and is sending a, um, the department's undersecretary for policy as an in-person representative. I also want to say that I'm disappointed in the administration's approach to the security situation in Iraq uh, based on all evidence, it appears the administration is more concerned about the security of oil reserves than of the Iraq, uh, Iraqi people or even its weapons of mass or even the uh, su su supposed uh, weapons of mass destruction. Let me tell you why. First, the administration did not begin preparations for Iraqi reconstruction until early 2003. Although AID AID's secret and exclusive contracting process has been criticized elsewhere. The bottom line is that the White House did not tell them to start preparing for the war's aftermath until 2003. In contrast, the administration began preparing to secure Iraqi oil fields months earlier. The Army asked Halliburton back in November to develop a contingency plan for extinguishing oil well fires, repairing damage, and continuing operations. This begs the question, why wasn't the same level of preparation given to humanitarian relief with respect to weapons of mass destruction? During the first days of occupation in Baghdad, the military rushed to secure a single government agency, the oil ministry. They did not secure hospitals, electrical grids, or water facilities. As the military rushed by these facilities, and rushed by, I might add, the Iraqi National Museum. It also bypassed Iraq's nuclear headquarters and a nuclear research facility. These are known nuclear sites that the IAEA has inspected dozens of times and that contained sealed containers of nuclear material. U.S. forces left them unguarded for weeks while hundreds of people looted them. In a series of investigated artic investigative articles on these lootings, the Washington Report, uh, Post reports that, inexplicably, these facilities are still not secure. As a result, the military says it is now impossible to determine whether nuclear material was stolen. I would like to submit these articles, uh, Mr. Chairman, for the record. 
If this is the administration's record for securing materials that are highly questionable, this is their record for securing materials that can be connected to the concerns that many have expressed. This is their record. We need to reflect on the whole reason why this administration went to war against Iraq. And one can only imagine the state of security for humanitarian relief efforts. Mr. Chairman, before the war, the Army's Chief of Staff, uh, General Shinseki, testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee. When asked how many troops were necessary to secure Iraq after the war, he said several hundred thousand. But superiors in the administration refused to listen. Two days after the general testified, the administration sent Deputy Defense Secretary Wolfowitz to publicly rebuke him, saying his estimate was way off the mark. The administration has now reduced the number of troops in Iraq to fewer than 150,000. As, as a result, this weekend, General David McKiernan, the commander of ground force in Iraq, made a frank and disturbing comment. He said, quote, ask yourself if you could secure all of California with 150,000 troops. The answer is no. This individual is the commander of the U.S. ground forces. But again, in spite of this dire situation, the administration plans to reduce the number of troops by tens of thousands more over the coming months. What is most troubling about these actions is that they're taking place while the administration is excluding the international community from assisting with security and other critical functions. Dr. Blix and Dr. El Baradai, for example, have both offered to dispatch trained international weapons inspectors to assess the looted nuclear facilities and help search for those uh, elusive weapons of mass destruction. But their offers have been rebuffed. On January 14th, only six weeks after UN inspectors began their search for such weapons, the President denounced the UN inspection process for taking too long. Yet today, almost two months after the start of the war, and without the obstacles of the Hussein regime, the administration still has not found such weapons. It is a misconception to assume that the U.S. forces are the most effective to administer a post-Saddam Iraq. Certainly, Iraqis are happy to be rid of Hussein. But many Iraqis blame their current humanitarian crisis on a decade of U.S. support for economic sanctions. Certainly, they're pleased to be free of a tyrant. But they're extremely skeptical, skeptical of a reconstruction effort by a single occupying nation, and especially by that nation's military force. Mr. Chairman, we know the factions inside and outside Iraq are trying to exploit this anti-American sentiment to their advantage. The Washington Post reported that in the city of Najaf, for example, Shiite leaders are denouncing the U.S. military occupation. As a result, U.S. troops are not patrolling or providing security there, at least in, in this portion of uh, Iraq, it appears. U.S. troops are not being used to support security efforts, and unilateral actions by the administration can only serve to further inflame these factions. Without the inherent legitimacy and expertise of the international community, the administration may end up creating a larger problem than it hoped to solve. Mr. Chairman, last week the President landed aboard the USS Lincoln and proclaimed victory in Iraq. He spoke in front of a large banner that read, Mission Accomplished. Clearly, this mission is nowhere near finished. And I'm concerned that the administration's cavalier attitude will end up costing this country more than we know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, th I thank the gentleman. Mr. Janklow, <coughs> Governor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll be extremely brief with my comments. I, I really appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you setting up this meeting for today. At this point in time, there can't be anything more appropriate than to look at the question of humanitarian assistance following the military operation overcoming barriers. 
I, I'm not as smart as a lot of other people that have all the answers to these types of things. My understanding is we just came through a war. In this war, all kinds of different things happen. Very little goes according to actual plan. A perfect example of the kinds of misinformation you can get in a war is you can read stories in very credible newspapers that talk about 100,000 objects plus disappearing from a museum, and then you can find out in reality it may be a couple hundred objects that have disappeared from a museum. These kinds of uh, misinformation happen during war. As a matter of fact, I'm pleased, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the testimony before this committee is under oath. Uh, with people appearing, and I realize I wish the administration also would send folks from the Defense Department, but to say that they'll be here Thursday as opposed to today at this point in time doesn't violate any sensitivities that I have. I think it's more important that things continue on an orderly basis, recognizing the Congress bears the ultimate responsibility on behalf of the people for, uh, for, the, for the oversight. I also think, Mr. Chairman, that, uh, that we now get an opportunity to look at what worked, what didn't. But as you said in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, I think it's incredibly important that we understand that there are basic levels of service that have to become functioning. I, I, um, I'm old enough to remember some of the things following the Second World War and how long it took, uh, for example, in some of those countries to get the electrical system running, to get the water systems working, to get the basic public transportation operating. I realize Iraq is about the size of California, but I also understand that's where it ends that the vast, vast, vast majority of the people in Iraq are clustered into metropolitan centers as opposed to cities that run for hundreds of miles, uh, as you have in the state of California. Uh, the, uh, the, the difference between the two is really what's on, what takes place outside the cities. But for all practical purposes, there's still basic telephone service, there's still water that has been restored, there's electrical services that are up and running, and clearly these weren't world-class operations before the war started. So I think uh, our country's been able to accomplish a lot. We all wish it was more. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding these hearings so we can find out the extent to which uh, humanitarian assistance that follows military operations has barriers. What are they? Let's hope we can all learn from this and, uh, and go forward. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank both gentlemen. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose, without objection so ordered. I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. We have two panels. We have um, uh, part of that panel will be Lieutenant General Jay Garner, retired Director of Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance, Department of Defense in a taped testimony, um, I would uh, just uh, acknowledge uh, to uh, my ranking member and colleague, Mr. Janklo, that we did, in fact, ask uh, Jay Garner to, to testify um, uh, using uh, modern technology. They said they would provide a tape, and I was frankly, I didn't pursue it, and uh, uh, the part of me that didn't pursue it was not wanting the system to break down as we uh, tried to make it work, but also the recognition that um, he will be available to this committee in the future to testify, and in fact, will be testifying to others. So I, I just basically feel this is an introductory hearing to uh, a effort that this committee, with the ranking member's support, will be pursuing with some vigor. Uh, so uh, we will be hearing first from Jay Garner, and um, uh, we will not be able to question him. We will not be able to swear him in. We'll take his testimony as it comes in tape. And I guess we're going to lower the lights a bit and listen to that. Then I will uh, swear in both our uh, witnesses in our first panel and then go to the second panel. So if we could start the tape. Any popcorn? <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for arranging for this session today. I regret that I'm unable to testify in person to you and your committee. And I would say that were I able to be in Washington, I'd do so. But to be really honest with you, there's nowhere, no place I'd rather be right now than in Baghdad. Uh, Baghdad is, uh, is the center of uh, opportunity that our country has that uh, it won't have another 
many, many years. It's the center of an opportunity to bring democracy to people that haven't had it for over 600 years. And it's the center of an opportunity to show everybody in the world uh, the compassion and the love Americans have for their fellow men. And uh, the fact that uh, when we undertake an endeavor, we only do it for the good of man. We don't do it for anything else. So wish I could be with you, but I'm glad I'm here. Having said that, uh, let me ask you, if, as you walk out of this little taped exercise we have, I'd like for you to take two points with you. <clears throat> One is there is no humanitarian crisis. Now, there are humanitarian issues, and there are some serious humanitarian issues. But this organization we have over here will work through all those. But the point is the crisis that was predicted, and I thought there would be a crisis, to be frank with you. The crisis that was predicted never materialized, so we're very fortunate there. Second, we arrived in Baghdad three weeks ago today with 10 people. In those three weeks, we've gone up to over 1,100 people. Uh, since that time, there's a lot of things that have been accomplished. Now, I know you read a lot of criticism of what's going on here. But the fact of the matter, we've only been here three weeks, and we've done an awful lot of things in conjunction with the military side of this, Gen uh, Lieutenant General McKernan's folks. So the military civil effort is, is done an awful lot. I'm going to outline that for you as we go through this. I'd really like for you to look at Iraq as we see it here. You know, it's a country that's the size of California. It's got a population of over 23 million people. Uh, as you all know, it's a cradle of civilization. The fact of the matter is civilization started here. Uh, the first laws were codified here. It has a rich history and legacy and in human spirit and human endeavor, uh, much of which we carry with us throughout the, the Western world today. But what is modern Iraq has been the epicenter of some of the world's largest and most powerful empires. They haven't had any freedom here in, I think, it's 638 years. As you know, Saddam Hussein took control here in 1979. And over the years, the, br the brutality of his regime is just unbelievable. If you I wish you could walk in my shoes a day down in the side, down in Basra, in the southern part of Iraq. The, the brutality down there is overwhelming. You go down there and you see the plight of the people. I walked in a hospital down there Monday, and it has open sewage lines running through the hospital. Largest hospital in Iraq. You see the brutality of the people down there, and then you walk in, back, come back to Baghdad, and walk through one, one of these damn palaces he's has, and there's dozens of them. And it's just... Enormous wealth went into him, and you can't imagine how a human being can run his life that way, much less try to govern people that way. It's the most horrible thing you've ever seen. And I've been in some bad places in my life, but this is the, the, the totality of the regime here is just sickening. Uh, Iraq has gone through three wars under Saddam Hussein. It's gone through two, two rebellions, one in the north, one in the south. And then it's gone through the cruelty of the regime. Uh, not only the torturing he put people through and the deaths that he put people through, but the fact that he manipulated the regime by using things like public services, turn off the health, turn off the water, turn off the electricity, that type of thing. So that the, the brutality and the horrors here are just really unbelievable. What we have here, we're going to turn all that around. And we're already turning all that around. And you'd be proud of the people that the nation sent over here to do that. Let me give you some data points of Iraq just before the war started. Just before the war, only 60% of the people in Iraq had access to safe drinking water, to potable water. Now, down in Basra, the place I was just talking about, which is the largest southern city, Ten of Basra's 21 portable water, portable water treatment facilities didn't work. They didn't work at all. So half, the, half of their ability to have potable water uh, never worked. And they didn't have enough facilities to give potable water to all the people to begin with. 70% 70 70 of the sewage treatment plants were in urgent need of repair. I mean, open raw sewage. <clears throat> uh, there was over... 500,000 metric tons of raw sewage dumped into the Tigris and Euphrates River daily. Now, as you know, the bulk of the people 
live along the fertile crescent of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And so they used the Tigris and Euphrates as their source of water, but yet it was, it was nothing but a carrier of raw sewage. Before the war, 70% of the children in Iraq suffered from malnutrition. And there's another st static there is of children under, under the age of five, they had the highest death rate in the Middle East. In fact, they had a higher death rate than any country in North Africa. <clears throat> Before the war, Iraq's electrical power system was operating at half its capacity, which is 5,500 megawatts. Before the war, 80% of Iraq's 25,000 schools were in extremely poor condition. The schools on average only had one book per six students. And there are many recorded cases of the student load being as high as 180 students per classroom. 60% of the population was totally dependent on the oil for food program. In other words, it, their, their means of subsistence was oil for food. So you look at that and you say, okay, where are we today? Where are we three weeks later? Before the war started, the Iraqi people has had a 60 day stockage of food. And although there was a lot of looting in fact, rampant looting after the war, the, the World Food Program still had large stocks in country, and they're bringing in about 487,000 metric tons of food per month now. It's not been distributed yet, but they're bringing the food in. The rations for June that would have been distributed under the World Food Program were already on their way to Iraq. Now, the distribution of this food now is going to be a challenge. Here's the problem is after the war, the, the whole food distribution program involved thousands and thousands of agents to do that. And uh, after the war, many of the agents, in many places, agents disappeared. They were Baptists or something else, and they disappeared. In many of the places, the trucks that did the distribution disappeared, were sold, stolen, etc. So the, the distribution system is still prevalent in Iraq, but it has big missing gaps. <coughs> so what we're going to do in the next 30 days is we're going to distribute food. They're in a food crisis, but there is a distribution. There could be a distribution crisis. So we're going to flush this out over about the next three weeks and find out where the seams are, where the gaps are, where the voids are, and we'll fill all those in. We're working with, uh, we're working with uh, the World Food Program Manager in the UN and other people to do this. <clears throat> in both the North and the South today, uh, many of the Iraqi people have more electric service today than, they had, than they've had the past 12 years. In fact, uh, in the town of Basra, they have uh, electricity 24 hours a day for the first time ever. Now, only in Baghdad are we really suffering, have a major suffering from uh, electric shortages, which are below pre-conflict levels. The reason for that is we, we've got all the grids repaired in Baghdad, but, but half of Baghdad's capacity came from the north and the south. And what's been broken is... Uh, is the 400 kV line, 400 kilovolt line. And we just got in our uh, uh, host of Bechtel engineers that are specialists in 400 kV power grids. And we married them up with the Iraqi engineers, who, by the way, are very skillful. The Iraqis are very, very good technocrats. Our prediction right now is that the 400 kV lines will be repaired and be back where they can generate and, tra <coughs> and transmit electricity within the next two to three weeks. <clears throat> Hopefully two, but we think certainly about three. <clears throat> There's been no major disease outbreak in the country. However, there are some, there are a few reported cases of cholera in the South. They're, they're being contained. Although many of Iraq's hospitals are up and running, water, the water supply and the electrical power to the hospitals is sporadic. And the national medical supply system is not functioning. Not, let me tell you the problem with the whole distribution system in Iraq, and it comes down to communications. In order to wage, to wage the war effectively, the coalition took down all of the communication structures. They should have done that, saved lives doing that, made the war go faster, and contributed to the victory. It was instrumental in the victory. But now we're living with that. And the problem we have now, there's no, communi there's no communications anywhere in Iraq. Uh, 
you're sitting in a bank and you want to talk across the street, you need to get out and walk outside the bank, walk across the street to do your talking because there's no phone service. And so there's no way that there can be any dialogue or any communication throughout Iraq. And it, as you know, it's a top-down uh, society. And so everything emanates from the ministries in Baghdad. And they push all information, all everything, down to the provinces, from the provinces down to the to the uh, municipalities, municipalities down to towns. So that's missing. So everything that we're putting in place now is a manual system, and it's incredibly difficult to do that. And we're doing it, and the people are doing it. The military is, is really doing all the heavy lifting in that force, but it's a slow, ponderous system. And it's not going to get better until we get communications. Now, in about three weeks, we'll have a cell phone service in Baghdad, but Baghdad only. We were not funded to do communication. We're going to move some money and we're going to put the backbone system in and we should be able to do that within within a couple of months which will allow communications from Baghdad down to each of the 17 provinces. Uh, but beyond that we won't have communications until we do some really major, major reconstruction work. And I don't, we're trying to figure out what that costs now and I don't know what that would cost. However, if you get the wall sanctions lifted and we start pumping oil and we start selling oil, putting in a trust fund for Iraqi people, it can be used for things like that. So this, the, the glass is half full. We just got to keep filling it up. We're working toward a, the, uh, the vital improvement of a security, envi uh, a security environment. Everything emanates around security, especially in Baghdad. Security is not good in Baghdad for a variety of reasons. <coughs> and the, the soldiers are doing the best they can. Uh, they are out doing some patrolling. They are, have an awful lot of uh, uh, static sites that they're having to guard. They, they, around the Baghdad area, the, uh, the coalition forces are having to guard over 250 static sites. And that reduces the amount of troops they have to do foot patrolling. So <clears throat> that's a problem. What we're doing is we're bringing back the police force to date. We've gotten back a little, a little over half of the police force. I think by the end of this week, we'll have probably six or 7,000 out of what was originally about 10,000. They'll slowly come back. We're putting them through a little training program with the military, and then they will begin doing two things. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll start doing guarding static sites, and they will also begin doing foot patrolling with the military. And that's going to go on a long time. We're going to have to completely retrain the, uh, the Iraqi police force. It wasn't a good police force. It was a corrupt police force. They didn't make much money. They went into corruption to supplement themselves. They never had much professional training. So we'll get them back on. We'll give them a basic amount of training. We'll start them patrolling with our people. We'll have them pick up uh, a lot of the static sites, which will release our troops to do more, more foot patrolling. And over time, we'll retrain them, and we'll be able to then begin releasing the troop requirements that we have. Uh, the next four weeks, I've got a, a series of priorities, and I'll go over those with you just before we end this testimony. But one of the first, most important things we have to do is to pay money, get money in the hands of the people. They haven't been paid uh, since March. Some, some were paid in March. Many weren't because of the war. So there's a fair amount of people that haven't been paid since the uh, beginning of February. And what I'm talking about here is public servants. <clears throat> the public servants, the police, pensioners, that type of people. What we did is we didn't know who the public servants were. We didn't know who the police were. We didn't know who the pensioners were when we began doing our planning back in Washington and in Kuwait. So we made the decision to initially put out an emergency payment of $20. We selected $20 because it's a few dollars above the poverty level, and we didn't want anybody criticizing us for paying, it, paying at the poverty level. But we said if we do this, it allows us to do a couple of things. Number one, it'll put money in the hands of people fairly quick. Number two, it will allow us to begin track the system that the Iraqis had for paying. And number three, it'll begin to identify those people who are really public service, police, pensioners, and that. Now, to date, we've paid over a million people the $20. <clears throat> so the next step is to begin pay salaries. And so what our plan is, is during the month of May, catch them up on the April uh, sal salaries. Then as we begin the 1st of June, catch them up on the May salary, and by the end of June, catch them up on the June salary. And they typically paid 
between the end of the month, between the middle of the month and the end of the month. So we will be called up by the end of June. This will infuse uh, a lot of money back into the hands of the people, and we need to do that because, like I said, they haven't been paid, many of them since February, and, and the rest they haven't been paid since March. Now, the problem with this, again, is communications because what we're going to have to do is we got an idea how many, we, we know how many people there are out there. So we got to take the money from the central bank in Baghdad, pay everybody in Baghdad out of that, take the, mo the, the rest of the money, and move it out to the 17 provinces. Uh, there's no communications there, so we're going to have to, to issue Thirai telephones, uh, which can't be used when you're inside. So we, we issue Thirai telephones, tell them what time of day to walk outside, what time they're going to take the telephone calls. In some cases, they'll be using military communications. We have to move the money simultaneously, get it to the provinces, move it under guard, keep it under guard till it's all paid out. <coughs> And then from the province down, to a large degree, it's going to be word of mouth. Now, we'll put this out over TV. We'll put it out over the radio, that type of thing. But we don't have the ability to push the money in down to the banks that are below the provinces. So it'll be a manual system of people coming up the province and getting paid. So it'll take a while. Once we put the money down there, we'll have to keep it secured under guard and people there to pay it until we paid it out. So this may be a rolling pay period once we start it in about a week and a half from now, actually till the end of June. And we'll keep you informed on that. We're, uh, we're working hard with the World Food Program to buy both the northern crops and the southern crops. Actually, you buy the southern crops first. They harvest first. And beginning now, they're already harvesting in the south. And that rolls all the way up to the north and uh, finishes the harvesting in July. <clears throat> so we're going to buy the, we're either going to, if they don't buy the crops, we're going to buy it. If we buy it, we'll buy it out of the, uh, the frozen assets. What I didn't tell you earlier is all of the pay comes from the frozen assets. None of that is from appropriated money. And if we buy the, uh, if we have to buy the wheat and the barley and that type of thing, we'll buy that out of frozen assets also. And we'll begin buying uh, the crops this month, in the month of May. Now, what that's going to do, paying salaries, and then buying the agricultural crops will infuse a lot of money in the system and bring the economy back. There is the, you know, there is a chance of some inflation in that, but right now things are so drastic that we do have to get money in the hands of people. We're going to do that. Uh, we're working hard to have the national grid operational by the end of May, and like I told, like I spoke to before. But once we do that, that will substantially improve the power all, all over the country. But that's not the end of the story. The problem is, with summer coming, is quite frankly, it's already here, but it gets hotter and hotter every day. And the hotter it gets, the greater demand there is on the electrical system because air conditioning, just like it is in our country. So even though we bring things back to full capacity, <clears throat> we won't have enough to run the whole country at one time, so we'll have to manage the distribution of electricity. And they've, they've always done that before. But I think once we get everything repaired by the end of this month, we'll have a greater capacity, and I think we're a little bit better managers, so it'll be a little better. It won't be any worse than it was before, and hopefully it'll be a little better than it was before. The one thing I'll say about the Iraqi people, though, that they are highly educated, and their, and their technocrats are extremely skillful. Their doctors are very good. Their engineers are very good. Their, their law people are very good. Their administrators are very good. So there's a, it, it's, a ha, it's a glass half full uh, activity. Once we get all the dots connected, I think this thing will go pretty good. It's a... Uh, it's also a country, you know, that, that has the, the wealth of oil with it. And uh, as the president said, the prime minister said, the oil of Iraq is for the people of Iraq. And we continually make that point with them. And I think what will be very demonstrable to, to them is once the sanctions are moved and we begin selling oil for them, that we put that in some sort of reserve for the Iraqi people where we can begin to spend that money visibly for them and only for them. That's an important thing. Get, getting rid of the sanctions and then showing the Iraqi people and the world there's no design from our country or members of the coalition on oil. <clears throat> you know, we plan for this mission under the most difficult set of circumstances that we could think of, and that's good. I mean, we plan for a worse set of circumstances. <clears throat> the, the intelligence reports and the in-depth studies that were performed over a wide range of public and private organizations 
predicted a huge humanitarian crisis, and quite frankly, I predicted one too. I thought there would be a huge one. I thought we'd have an enormous number of displaced people and an enormous number of refugees. That just didn't materialize. So we're extremely lucky there. Uh, we're lucky in several places. There's no humanitarian crisis, and the oil fields weren't torched. So we have the wealth of oil uh, in our hands soon for this, and then we have no humanitarian crisis. So it really is a, is a good step toward building the democratic uh, government. Uh, the UN High Commissioner for Ref Refugees estimated there'd be 600,000 refugees, and he also estimated that cost about $60 million. <clears throat> and he also estimated there'd be another half a, uh, half a million Iraqis would be displaced. So we were looking at about uh, somewhere over about 1.1 million Iraqis either displaced or in refugee status. I mean, like I said, that didn't materialize at all. The World Food Program pre-positioned uh, 30,000 tons of food to feed 2.1 million people and, and also internally displaced people. That didn't materialize, so that's a good news story. <clears throat> due to the weaknesses of the Iraqi defense and really due, the, due to the skill of the coalition and the, you know, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Armed Forces in this were absolutely magnificent. And, and I'll tell you an interesting thing about this. Me as a, as a former career military guy, um, the precision of the attacks was such that it was surgical. I mean, very, there's very little war damage in the country very little, minimal. The speed at which they overwhelmed the enemy and entered Iraq, you know, they entered Iraq and you know, Baghdad, I mean, in, I think 16 days. Uh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Now, the damage you have in Baghdad really is much, of, most of the damage is from looting. Uh, and it's a big problem. When, uh, when the people naturally went in and demonstrated and looted against the government building as a reaction to getting rid of Saddam Hussein. <clears throat> but when they looted, they did about the most professional job I've ever seen. They took out everything. Nothing's left in those buildings. Then they broke all the windows. Then they broke down all the doors. Then they stripped out all the wiring. Then they pulled out all the pipes so that you go in any building, it is totally 100% gutted. There's nothing in there. And then they set the buildings on fire. So the problem we have, we have not only the inability for the ministries to communicate in a top-down system down to the provinces, we don't have anywhere for them to go to work. 16 of the 23 ministries have no buildings. So what our people have done, they found places for them to work, they're getting them back. We're going to have to now order thousands and thousands of desks, chairs, computers, that type of thing. But they're coming back. They're going to work, and we're gradually getting this system working again. <clears throat> Among the group here in Baghdad with me are a number of people who have done this sort of thing before. None of this is easy. This is all hard, hard stuff. But what's happened is we've got some very experienced people who have done this type of stuff before, and it's, uh, it's, it's made our job. We're able to attack problems a little faster, in fact, quite a bit faster, I think, than we would if we had people that didn't have the experience to do that. I'll name just a few of them there. General retired Ron Adams, who was the commander of the forces in Bosnia. General retired Jerry Bates, who handled the situation in Haiti. General retired Bruce Moore, who was in Bosnia and Kosovo and, and most of the African um, uh, crises that we've been in. Uh, from from Secretary, from uh, State Department, we have Bob Gifford, who is, who is putting together and reforming, retraining the police forces. Uh, from the Department of Treasury, we just got, we have an all-star team. I mean, it is the best bunch of guys you've ever seen in your life. We got we got Van Jorstead, George Molino, and David Nummy, and they have worked miracles on here in the, in the central bank, which has no ability to communicate. They found money. They're moving money. They're getting people paid. They're making the thing work. We got a great young man from USAID here named Chris Milligan, who has, since he came to USAID 15 years ago, he's done nothing but crisis work, and he's outstanding. And then we got a guy up north named Dick Nab. Dick Nab lived up there after, during and after provide comfort for 17 months with the Kurds, and I think before he leaves this time, they're probably going to erect a statue in his place. But the message there is there's a bunch of great people over here working there from all the agencies in U.S. government. And they've come together as a team. It's kind of one team, one fight, or one team, one piece, however you want to look at it. 
but they've done a marvelous job. It's an ad hoc operation glued together over about four or five weeks time. Uh, didn't really have enough time to plan, but although there was already some good planning that had been done before we came together. Uh, but they've coalesced here, they bonded together here, and, uh, and they're doing the Lord's work. And you'd be proud of them. You said, and I'm going to tell you, these are long, long days, very short nights, and no water. So it's a hard environment to work in, but they're doing great. And that's, I think that's the thing that, outside of the spirit of the Iraqi people, I think that's the thing that's impressed me the most is that these representatives from all different agencies working so hard together. <clears throat> This week, uh, we will complete the organization of what we call the Iraq Forum, and it's really the old Baghdad Convention Center. We're taking that convention center over. We're going to re refurbish it. We're going to put new communications in it, and it's going to be a center where all the center where all the NGOs and the international organizations all all can come together and work together on improving the situations throughout Iraq. And when we're through with this operation, we're going to turn that over to the Iraqi people. It'll be a nice center. It'll be much nicer than what they had. But in the meantime, it'll serve the reconstruction and the humanitarian efforts that are going on inside the country. <clears throat> it's really put in there to, to provide information, deconflict projects, and, and be a faster way of, of blossoming and helping the Iraqi people. <clears throat> As you'd expect, we're encountering some barriers and getting assistance and, to the Iraqi people. The primary barrier is security. It's still, it's still not a permissive environment. It'll get there. Every day gets better, but right now, in order to move people to the ministries, uh, I have to have uh, two MP vehicles move with them. They have to wear body armor. They have to wear a Kevlar helmet uh, because it's, it's not safe out there. Uh, but like I say, every day gets better. The military is going to move in more troops. The police are coming back, so over time, that'll get better. <clears throat> Another challenge is communications. I've already alluded to that. Uh, communications get rapidly better here in Baghdad since we get cell phone service, but it'll take a while longer in the rest of the country. The final barrier is fuel. It's amazing that you'd have a fuel crisis or a few in, in a country that produces oil. But basically what the crisis is, is a shortage of gasoline, which they need to run their automobiles, their trucks, and things like that, and a shortage of liquid petroleum gas, which they everyone uses for cooking. The reason there's a shortage of those two is as you pump the crude and run it through the refinery, it produces the gasoline and the LPG. <clears throat> but the byproduct of, that, byproduct of that is a low-grade fuel oil that is then put into storage and sold later on. Well, all of the storage facilities are full and it can't be sold because of the sanctions. So what's happened is while there's a wealth of oil here, the system is constipated because you can't sell off any of the stuff that's stored because of the UN sanctions. And that is paralyzing. It is absolutely paralyzing. And you have to, I, I plead to you to do what you can do to lift those sanctions because they're, they're the wrong thing for the Iraqi people and they inhibit everything that we do. So they have to be removed. Once they're removed, there will never be another gasoline or LPG shortage here. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, what I want to do is take just a moment here, and I want to briefly go over for you 11 tasks that we think have to be accomplished, need to be accomplished by the 15th of June, give or take four or five days. The reason for that, I think the next 30 to 40 days is probably the critical period now in, in this operation. If we get through the next 30 or 40 days, we make a, if we make headway on a lot of major things, we will put ourselves in a, in a marvelous up ramp where things will begin happening. If we don't do that, we're on a negative ramp, I believe. So what we've done is we've formed a, a civilian military team for each of these tasks I'm going to talk a big team, for each of these tasks I'm going to talk to you about. And that team is going to work these, work these things day and night until we get them done on by the 15th, 16th, or 17th of June. The first one is a security problem. That is mainly in Baghdad, and, and we're doing a, a raft of things to make security better. <clears throat> the second one is paid salaries na nationwide. And what I told you, our goal is to have paid three months' worth of salaries, uh, three months' worth of salaries by the 30th of June. The third one 
is return the police to work nationwide and especially in Baghdad and have them trained. That's minimum training, but have them trained enough where they can get out and patrol. Return the ministries to a functional level. In other words, have them all back and have them beginning to work. Restore the basic services in Baghdad. Baghdad's, you know, Baghdad was the center of gravity for the war, and I'm going to tell you, it's the center of gravity for putting this country back together again also. Prevent a fuel crisis. You can help on that because we can get those sanctions lifted. Purchase the crops north and south. That puts money back in the hands of the people along with paying salary. Solve the food, the food distribution challenges, and that goes back to the, the distributing of the food and the fact that the distribution system is broke, so we're going, to, we're going to piece that back together over the next month. To install town councils nationwide, and in many cases it's already been done. What the military has done is they go into a place and they settle down. They have them elect a town council and they start a democratic process there <coughs> to, um, to begin running the town with the town's people. What the military has done, what CENTCOM has done, is they formed a team for every province. There's, there's Baghdad and then 17 provinces in the, uh, in the country here. So they've formed 18 teams. They call these government support teams. They range from anywhere from 20 to 30 people on them, and they're really in there to go in and support the government and make the government run. At the same time, under the USAID contract, we have a team of 12 to 15 people going into the same locations, and they do local government, and they help in, in, in local government. So we're putting those two teams together. What we'll add to that team is other things that needs to happen in those provinces. In other words, an engineer team or a major pr a construction team, that type of thing. So in each province now, by the end of June, you will have a structure in there with the Army colonel or a senior civilian running it that will have anywhere from oh, 35 to 60 or 70 people in it, and they'll be working on all the things we need to do in there from a reconstruction standpoint, from a humanitarian standpoint, and most importantly, from a governmental standpoint. And then the last one is to prevent uh, an outbreak of cholera and dysentery. And like I told you, we've got 17 reported cases of cholera, but they're all contained. So thus far, we've, we've been good at that. Um, but it, cholera and dysentery boil down to sanitation and water. And uh, we started a massive garbage collection program here in Baghdad, in fact, throughout the country. Interesting thing there is the curbs came to me last week, and they want to take the garbage collection people from major Kurdish cities one at a time and move them into Baghdad and clean up a piece of Baghdad and then go back to their city. And I asked Mr. Talibani is the one that brought that to me and he said he and Mr. Barzani, you know, the two Kurdish leaders, he said they want to do that because they want the Kurdish people to be proud of their capital. So I thought that was pretty good. And that's a good start for the beginning of some cohesion in what has always been a fractious and troubled country. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'd like to reiterate to you and your committee that for the short time we've been here, uh, the people that you sent here have achieved a lot. And you gave, the, the nation gave you some great people, and they've done just an absolutely marvelous job. Still a hell of a lot to be done. Uh, and we're only on the tip of the iceberg right now, but I'm going to tell you the glass is half full. I hope I've answered the questions of your committee. If I haven't, I'll, uh, I'll send you whatever you need to clarify the things that might have been confusing to you. I wish we could have had some dialogue here because I'd like to have heard your questions and I'd like to have more of an opportunity to, to discuss this with you. But uh, I thank you for your support. Uh, I thank you for taking care of that great nation of ours. And, and just think about our country. I mean, what a marvelous, marvelous place to be from and a place to work in that you're able to do things like we're doing right here, that you take a people that have been oppressed really for 600 years and you give them things they've never had before, you give them opportunities they never had before, and you're able to turn it into a democratic society, which we'll do. This will be a democratic society. And what we're doing here, the success we have here, will, I predict to you, it will change the whole Middle East. And if we fail here, it'll change the whole Middle East in a way we don't want to see it, see it happen. So uh, with the people we have here, with your help, uh, we'll get this job done. God bless you. Thank you very much. We thank Dr. Er, um, General Gardner's participation. When I was in Iraq, he was very generous with his time, and I think he was very generous in his very long statement, but that doesn't get around the fact that we aren't 
able to question him, and uh, Congress will be able to, I guess, later this week. Is that right? Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to um, thank Mr. Ruppersberger for being here. And, um, and Mr. Tierney, we haven't yet sworn in our first panel, and so if you had any opening statement or any comment, I'd be happy to recognize you. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Let me um, um, announce that uh, Mr. Richard Green, Principal Deputy Assistant, Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration, Department of State, and Mr. William J. Garvelink, Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator, Bureau of De Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, U.S. Agency for International Development, under the auspices of the State Department as well, are here. And at this time, gentlemen, if you'd rise, we'll swear you in, and then we'll take your testimony. You raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No, for the record, both our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And Mr. Green, we'll start with you. I think you realize your statement will not be as long as the previous one on video. Yes, sir. Um, but we're very eager to hear your testimony, and thank you both for participating. Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll, I'll summarize my uh, record statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss humanitarian assistance following military operations. Providing effective humanitarian assistance is critical in establishing stability in post-conflict situations. I'm just going to have you move the mic a little closer. Even though we're hearing you, just a little closer would help. And is in keeping with America's core values. Uh, in Iraq, we're dealing with major humanitarian challenges every single day. And our context, as uh, emphasized by General Garner, is that there were significant infrastructure problems pre-conflict that so far General Garner has only been there for three weeks. It's only been 12 days since President Bush declared the end to major combat operations in Iraq, and that we're making dogged progress every single day. Our approach to Iraq incorporates many lessons from previous post-conflict assistance efforts, and it includes the following elements. First, civil military cooperation and coordination is absolutely essential. From the first stages of planning and assessment to the eventual, through initial delivery of assistance to the eventual handover to nationally led institutions. We do everything we can to ensure that military plans take into account vulnerable non-combatants and the humanitarian infrastructure so that there is minimal damage to both. For Iraq, the multi-agency humanitarian planning team and numerous exchanges between senior state and DOD officials underscored the importance of incorporating effective humanitarian response into our overall Iraq campaign efforts. The civil military exchange continues on a daily basis on a whole range of humanitarian assistance issues in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Second, our approach relies on the expertise of the main providers of humanitarian assistance worldwide, which are humanitarian agencies and other international and non-governmental organizations. They have the technical expertise and experience to assess the needs of refugees and internally displaced persons across the sectors of protection, food, water, sanitation, health, shelter, and education. Third, the prompt and effective delivery of humanitarian assistance depends upon a permissive security environment where adequate security and public safety measures are in place. Clearly, the most pressing concern of humanitarian agencies in parts of Iraq and Afghanistan is the absence of a permissive security environment, again, a point uh, emphasized by General Garner. Fourth, our approach reflects a clear linkage between the establishment of effective coordination mechanisms among the humanitarian agencies operating on the ground and how well assistance programs actually work. In Afghanistan, for example, the Afghans and the international community developed a new mechanism for coordinating humanitarian and reconstruction assistance efforts. This initiative called Program Secretary Structure twinned UN agencies with counterpart Afghan government ministries and perhaps just as importantly provided an overall framework for NGOs to help plug into. Our emphasis on effective coordination mechanisms is also why we strongly supported the recent Strong, strongly supported and urged the recent reentry to Baghdad of the, of the UN's humanitarian coordinator for Iraq and other UN international staff to join the almost 4,000 UN national staff who remained in Iraq during the recent conflict. Fifth, our approach 
leverages the capacity of these skilled, experienced, and internationally mandated humanitarian assistance organizations by establishing formal civilian military coordination operation centers. We set up one in Kuwait, set up one in Jordan, and as General Garner said, we're about to set up one in Baghdad. These centers uh, provide direct access between humanitarian planners and military officials on the, military, on the myriad of logistical and security issues involved in post-conflict relief operations. Sixth, our approach emphasizes the importance of early and significant funding. We build our funding requirements and decisions around the needs of the populations that these organizations will assist. In Afghanistan, the 2001 Emergency Supplemental Appropriation Act provided the U.S. government the ability to jumpstart the efforts of the key international humanitarian organizations, thus averting a humanitarian disaster. In Iraq, the Emergency Wartime Supplemental Appropriation Act of, of 2003 provides $2.4 billion for relief and initial reconstruction that will serve a similar purpose. Seventh, our approach relies on the assessments and work plans done by the international organizations for the international community. We also work closely with our NGO partners to get their assessment of the needs in an affected country as they play an important role in filling critical gaps in the programming done by international organizations. Our funding decisions are based on needs and activities outlined in these work plans, which are closely coordinated among the agencies. Eighth, also on the critical funding issue, our approach emphasizes the importance of international burden sharing. Securing fair share contributions from other international donors is a major USG goal. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, each post-conflict humanitarian relief operation has its own set of unique circumstances, but we don't have to invent, reinvent the wheel each time. Providing humanitarian assistance in post-conflict environments is an extraordinarily challenging task. And you can just uh, uh, hark back to some of the examples General Garner was providing. We've worked hard to coordinate planning and implementation within the U.S. government and to forge good working relationships with our key U.N. and NGO partners in providing humanitarian assistance in complex humanitarian agencies. We'll continue to do everything possible to facilitate the great work they do on behalf of the international community. Uh, thank you, and I'd be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Green. Mr. Garbalink. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk today about uh, humanitarian assistance efforts following, <coughs> excuse me, following military operations. Although the specific circumstances our relief teams face today in Iraq are unique, we have learned a great deal from previous experiences in northern Iraq more than a decade ago uh, in Somalia, Bosnia, Haiti, Rwanda, Kosovo, and most recently Afghanistan. Uh, there is a division of responsibility between the State Department and my agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development. In very general terms, State works most closely with U.N. agencies with a special emphasis on refugees and the International Committee of the Red Cross. USAID works mostly with its PVO NGO partners, providing general humanitarian assistance and responding to the needs of internally displaced persons. The exception is that the USAID is the, per, per, is the principal funder of the World Food Program. But regardless of the division of responsibilities, we share general principles when responding to humanitarian emergencies. First, early planning is essential. Sometimes we have only hours or days to plan if it's a hurricane, uh, or we have weeks in the case of Afghanistan, and sometimes we have months, which we did in the case of Iraq. The earlier planning begins, the better. And this, a good example of this was Iraq, where for several months teams met in Tampa with Central Command and up in Washington. And it, in, it included all of U, all U.S. government agencies that were involved, plus NGOs and U.N. agencies. The se um, second, we cannot plan in isolation. We must engage immediately all the international humanitarian agencies that will be involved. We need to rely on the full range of these organizations. Each has its own strengths, and all are necessary to accomplish the job. United Nations agencies work effectively with host governments and national programs. The International Committee of the Red Cross is most effective in conflict situations, and the NGOs are most effective in smaller community situations and community of development activities. 
Third, the provision of assistance must be driven by needs assessments. To use our expertise and our resources effectively, we must know precisely what is needed and where it is needed. We can't justify sending assistance to these countries blindly. Finally, the use the U.S. and one or two other donors cannot respond to humanitarian emergencies alone. The international community must share the burden. When humanitarian assistance follows military operations, these principles become even more important. The military plays several critical roles in these kind of relief operations. The military becomes an enabler for, human for the humanitarian community. The mil military often provides the initial assistance in unstable environments. It does some of the initial assessments. And the min military facilitates the entry or return of humanitarian organizations. Consequently, early planning with the, with the military is critical as it allows the military to understand the humanitarian architecture that is on the ground. In Afghanistan, for example, UN agencies and NGOs had a long presence there. In the center and south of Iraq, there were no NGOs, and the UN presence was very limited to, mo to only monitoring activities, and that's important to know as we plan to work together to provide humanitarian assistance. Coordination and infor information sharing are essential to identifying the most critical needs in the emergency and to the bottlenecks to providing that assistance. In one of the first operations of this sort in Somalia, we established a humanitarian operations center to coordinate uh, with, with military forces on the ground, uh, U.S. government agencies, the U.N. and NGOs. That model has been refined several times until it has been used effectively in the humanitarian operations center in Kuwait City today. Finally, assessments are critical, and, I th and for the first time in Iraq, uh, the military and civilian agencies are using the same assessment tools. We have learned a lot about how to coordinate with each other in the past decade, and though we have a ways to go, civilian agencies and the military have learned to meet the humanitarian needs of civilians in post-conflict settings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman, and um, we'll go to you first, Mr. Jankelow, Governor. And I think what we'll do is uh, We'll do five minutes the first pass and maybe 10 the second. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. If I could ask uh, both of you gentlemen, um, when I look at your testimony, you have well thought out, laid out plans in advance, criteria, protocols, whatever you'd like to call that you follow. Let me ask you first, Mr. Green, what didn't work according to your criteria? A and I realize the X's and O's always score touchdowns on the wall. Uh, sir, I think that, uh, again, given the, con I'm not, given the context, I mean, let me put your question into context in that I think that a lot is working. No, no, uh, what, what didn't work and, specific, and I, th and I and think, I think that, a lot is working yeah. too. And I think that, uh, a lot of our planning focused on dealing with major population displacements. Uh, we, we and many others, but the other international organizations projected that somewhere between 2.3 and 3 million Iraqis would be displaced during uh, conflict and that we'd have to put systems in place and that a lot of our focus would be getting assistance to displaced populations. And we didn't, thankfully, we didn't have that problem. I think what also didn't work uh, was that was, there was a pretty grand under estimation by us as, a, as to the degree of looting that would take place. And, uh, and now we're faced with uh, dealing with a lot of problems created by looting that I don't think uh, the extent was anticipated by anybody in the planning process. Mr. Garveling, what didn't work? Well, I, again, I, I would characterize it a little bit more <coughs> like, like Rich Green. And I think we didn't anticipate some of the things that, pro that, that happened, again, as, as Rich said the uh, population movements didn't happen. The, inten the, ex the intensity of the humanitarian crisis um, has not occurred. I think what we did not anticipate uh, to the extent that, that is out there now is some of the water and sanitation problems and the importance of electricity to, to maintaining uh, to, of reliable electricity for running hospitals and health clinics. 
I, I don't think we focused on those sorts of things. We were focused on population uh, movements uh, and let, let me, uh, refugees. Let, let me ask you if I could, and I'll start with you, Mr. Green. Uh, are, are the international, or, or, or you, Mr. Garvin, like either one of you, are the international organizations in place? I realize about 4,000 UN workers stayed there. We keep hearing conflicting reports. Are the, uh, is the UN there at work or isn't it? The UN is coming back into Iraq. Does that mean they're not at work now? They're coming they are, back they are, to work? They, they are at work now, but not at full capacity. Uh, at the end of this week, there will be about uh, something like 200 international staff, uh, and they're starting to come back in. Uh, this is where we tie back to security considerations, where uh, security considerations are impacting their ability to get out in the country and provide assistance efforts. Let me, if I can, and I'm trying to be very pointed, we'd like to know what are the barriers. I mean, as both of you say in your testimony, whether it was Bosnia, whether it was Kosovo, whether it was Afghanistan, every operation, you learn every crisis, every incident, you learn something. What is it that we're going to learn from this one? At this point in time, and I realize it's not over, we're looking at barriers. What barriers are there to overcome you didn't plan for other than the security barrier? In, in my view, that is the single most important barrier. And what's number two? And, and, uh, quickly setting up a civil administration structure in Iraq, getting ministries up and running. You, Mr. Garveling. We, we seem to be saying a lot of the same things, so I, I'm agreeing with, with Rich again. I, I think uh, the re security, obviously, is, is something that we thought would not be the kind of problem uh, it has turned out to be. Um, number two. Number two, I think, is the, the reestablishment of civil administration and rule of law. Well, if, if, if we bombed several of these ministries, which we did, I don't know that we bombed them all, but I know we bombed several of them. If we deliberately took out the communication system, um, what is it that we didn't anticipate with respect to setting up civil government? I mean, did we honestly think they'd all just show up for work when the shooting stopped or, or quieted down? I, th I think there were... I th let, me, let me preface it with okay. one more thing. According to the testimony we heard from, I believe it was the general, um, the police were corrupt, they were ill-trained, they weren't very good. The other technocrats are pretty good. So what is it that we, and I, I'm not trying to be critical, okay? Uh, I, what I'm trying to do is figure out how can we all learn? What, what is it that we need to learn? So from that perspective, what's the, what is it about the civil service that we didn't anticipate? I think, uh, with all due respect, sir, uh, we're learning lessons while we're on the ground there. And I, and I think we've found out the difficulty of assessing, accurately assessing the quality of the civil service, uh, the, the linkage to the Ba'ath Party by being outside of Iraq. And now that we're in and having conversations with people on a daily basis, we're in a much better situation okay. to assess what's going on and what's needed to have happen. What about you, Mr. Garvelink? Well, one of the things that, that we've seen in other uh, humanitarian situations of this nature, post-conflict uh, situations, is that the pace with which a conflict ends and the place at the pace within with which rule of law is restored um, is usually different. And that seems to be a problem that's very hard for the international community to do with. It's, it's easy, and whether it's Bosnia or Kosovo, um, to win a conflict. It's a little more difficult to train a police force and put it in place. Did, did both of you, you, both of you did hear the testimony of, of, uh, of, of the general. Which of his criteria, his 11-point criteria, do you think we're not going to be able to meet the deadline on with respect to June 15th or thereabouts? Because he made it sound like, and, and I realize he may not get all 11, but this was a, a darn important list from the perspective of uh, making sure that things went smoothly and without it, uh, he looked for the opposite to take place in Iraq. Which of his list do you think we're going to have trouble meeting and why? 
I, I think we're going to be able to accomplish or make significant progress on all, every one of these things. I know that a lot of activity is going on now, and I think that all these are doable. Now, the, I think the, a big variable here is the getting police back, getting police trained. It's one thing to get police back to work. It's another thing to have police back and trained that people trust and respect and they could implement. That rules. can't happen by June 15th. That, right. That, back, that, that won't happen. Trusted getting, and police, respected. getting police back to work, and there are significant numbers of police that have returned to work, can't happen. What about you, Mr. Carvin? Well, I'm just looking over the list and, and uh, some of the activities that he has listed here that, that my agency is involved in. I think there's a, a real chance to, to, if not accomplish them by June 15, come very close. No, no, sure. Example, I don't mean your agency. I mean all of them. Well, I know, but I, I guess I'm saying I, I can't speak to a number of these because okay. I have not been involved in them. If you talk about the public distribution system, I think that will be up and running. Uh, we've made a lot of progress working with the World Food Are Program. we going to be able to avoid a fuel crisis? Pardon? Are we going to be able to avoid a fuel crisis? Uh, again, that's not one I'm really familiar with. So Are you, I, Mr. Green? Uh, I think that already we've brought in emergency deliveries of uh, LPG gas, which, is, which runs a lot of the cooking stoves throughout Iraq, and so we're figuring out how to, res again, respond to the emergency. Will it be a normal distribution pattern? Uh, no, but will we be able to respond to an emergency? I think the answer is yes. Were the town councils democratically elected in the past? I, I, I don't know, sir. Do, do you, sir? Uh, no, I'm not sure. Well, how are we going to set up elected Democrat councils? What agency is? Is it the military that will be doing that? Who will be doing that? Well, I. Uh, for the Agency for International Development, we have our responsibilities for Iraq are divided in, in, in two basic categories. One is the bureau I work for, which does humanitarian assistance, and another bureau, the Asian Near East Bureau, does reconstruction. And the way we've divvied up responsibilities is democracy and governance, these sorts of activities are in the other bureaus. And they're not here today? Uh, correct. Okay. And so I have a hard time addressing the issue. We don't know how they're electing them, do we? No. Okay. Sir? I, I, I do not know that, sir. Uh, one, o one other question. With return to the um, buying the crops, I assume you got, uh, I mean, they were able to continue farming during all of this, and what you're saying is to the extent you can buy the crops, you put, you, you cool off the farmers and you get food on the shortest travel distance. Well, yeah, it's all of those. What, what, what's happened over the past few years in, under the Oil for Food program and the sanctions in Iraq is the, the local production uh, was not allowed to be purchased. And in the northern part of the country, they, they uh, have a fairly large wheat crop. I think they're expecting in the neighborhood of 600,000 tons this year. We're hoping to buy the surplus from the farmers and then feed it into the distribution system. But there's been no incentive uh, for the past few years for a farmer to grow anything because they can't legally uh, sell their crops. Thank, thank you. My time's expired. Thank you, gentle, uh, gentlemen. Mr. Rubersberger, please. Well, first, there are a lot of issues that we have to deal here with today. Uh, in the time that I have, I, I would like to address um, the planning that we had really prior to the war, and there were some statements made by certain people in the military that we should have done a little more planning. Uh, but what I would really like to get to <clears throat> at this point, um, I think right now, whenever you're going to stabilize a country, uh, you need to have order. And I assume that <clears throat> based on your testimony today that, that the, the order uh, needs to be uh, clearly uh, uh, taken care of, and, and at this point, we're having problems. From information that I've received is that one of the biggest issues that the coalition forces are having problem with is that there are a lot of uh, civilians that have guns, and there are a lot more guns than it was anticipated. Is that your understanding, or do you have any knowledge to that effect? Uh, that is a significant problem, uh, and, and, I, and I think, sir, in order to get a more detailed response on what the response locally will be to that question. We're going to have to uh, talk to representatives of the Defense Department. Right, who's really, really not here. But I think that 
the, the, the whole issue as we're trying to study and get information today is how do we best deal with that and you have to deal with the basics. And as a result of that, the, the lack of sec security that exists at this point um, really is preventing the humanitarian efforts to go forward. Correct? Is that your understanding? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll I, the, the either one. I mean, humanitarian efforts are going forward. Oh, no question. And look, and, I'm not and, here to. And the issue is, uh, can they go forward more effectively? And the answer is clearly yes, in a more right. secure environment. And what we're trying to establish is how we can, in, in our role, develop a plan to help uh, the military. You know, you, you go in as the military to invade, then you change your roles, and those roles are, are a lot different. And what we really would like to know is how, from your opinion, that we can we can effectuate something to help or to give resources or whatever is needed um, with respect to to establishing security so we can get to the next level. Well, clearly security is an issue and, and as you say, it, it's very difficult to provide humanitarian assistance or to expand the humanitarian assistance that's being provided without a secure environment, without the protection of silos where where wheat and other other commodities are stored. And, you know, clearly that's a concern for us. I'm sure it's a concern for our NGO colleagues, but it's a problem for the military. And, and that's an issue that, you know, I, I wouldn't presume to answer on their behalf. It's, it's a big concern and it complicates the humanitarian picture, but, but uh, not being... Yeah, from but from your perspective, what, you know, what, we, what do you feel that we need? You've been involved in other countries. Mm -hmm. What do you feel that we need? Now, well, this is a different situation. Each situation was different to move forward. Well, I, I guess uh, as from experience in other, in other situations like this, we need uh, the, the rule of law established as soon as possible. That's a police force. It's not really a military that does that. And so the introduction and establishment of a, of a police force would be very important. And the reason we talked, to, I raised the issue about the guns, I mean, how to effectuate that. And that's why we do have military police, and, and they're, they're becoming very active in their ways to do it. Let me get on to something that maybe you might know <clears throat> a little bit more about and answer the questions. We talk about the cost of what we need to do. We talk about, you know, after we have, have order and establish some type of government, um, <clears throat> that the citizens of Iraq need to d develop a quality of life, and that's hopefully what we can do through jobs, through, through uh, dealing with humanitarian concerns. Uh, but that costs a lot of money. And the unique situation about Iraq is that there is a lot of oil if it's taken care of in the right way, if it's marketed the right way. If, uh, we have, and I praise President Bush and, and the military for taking control of the oil fields and, and, and making sure that, that they were secure, and I believe they are secure. Um, is there in an effect now, and I guess this is through really a State Department question, um, negotiations with other countries um, and, and working with people within Iraq to develop that source of, of, uh, of oil that will help to bring money into the citizens of Iraq? Uh, sir, clearly the anticipation is that oil, the oil industry will get going and that oil revenues will be utilized by the Iraqi people to reconstruct and redevelop their country. Clearly, the, there is the anticipation that, that that will play the major role. I'm not talking about anticipation. Is there right now ongoing communications? Is there, is there right now a, an effort, a strong effort to there is develop? A, there is a strong effort going on, sir. And where, where, where are we going, or is it too confidential to talk about it at this hearing? Uh, I'd, I'd rather not. I don't, I don't think it's that confidential, but I don't, I don't think I should be the one to talk about it. Uh, all I can tell you is that a major emphasis is on that going well, on. Well, you know, from, from my point of view in this hearing, I want to make sure that, that, uh, that unless there's a reason that we shouldn't, I want to do what's best for our country first, but to help this situation, which should be best for our country and the world, <clears throat> we need to be more, in my opinion, aggressive. If we were being aggressive, that's fine, but I want to raise the issue of what we're doing in order to do two things, to, to work with other countries and establishing what we need to do with respect to the oil, which will give the resources to help that country. But secondly, there are a lot of countries that are, that are out there that should be allies of ours and that are we or are we not working with them, including France and Germany and those countries that really gave us a hard time prior to the war. We're doing everything possible to get the oil flowing in Iraq again, A, and B, we have mounted a, a major effort with countries around the world to solicit major contributions to the Iraq relief and reconstruction effort. Uh, 
the feedback from every country is that people are willing to come up with big bucks to contribute towards this effort. Are they also going to come up with uh, the resources and, and also the, 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 uh, uh, the people power, so to speak, to, to do the things that are necessary once we get this security there? Are they willing to move to that level so that the burden isn't completely on the United States and Great Britain? There have been offers from in-kind contributions of people and equipment from countries around the world. Uh, and we're having ongoing discussions with many How countries. How about France? Uh, there has been uh, discussions with France on contributions to on a number of uh, areas. Okay. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd love you to, um, I'd, I'd love to make sure you have a list of the uh, 11 items that, that General Garner gave. W were they given to you? Did you, Larry, if you, okay. I'm going to ask you to look through that list and tell me what you would think needs to be part of that in the first, uh, you know, mid to late June to establish a positive slope. You said 11 critical tasks to complete by mid late June to establish positive slope towards success in Iraq. So if you just look through that and see if you see anything that's kind of you would add to. Is there anything that you catch right off that you would add? No, it looks uh, pretty comprehensive to me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Is there anything? The only other thing, and it, I'm going to ask uh, you to put your mic a little closer, even though I hear you, both of you. Ah. Is is uh, the the restoration of the electrical grid? Okay. And that yeah. So restoration of the electrical grid. Okay. You think of anything else that you would add to it uh, before the hearing ends? I'd love if you'd add so maybe periodically you'd just take a second look. Um, there's a general acceptance that on a scale to 1 to 10, the war effort was an 11, that it was pretty stunning. And I think uh, there's a feeling that people will look back and say this was a moment in time in which th there was. Uh, some classic changes in battle, uh, and it'll be studied. Uh, but I think most people would agree that uh, that the failure to rebuild Iraq, the failure to get it on a on a positive slope, uh, in which people are back to work, kids are back to school, uh, the economy is starting to percolate after 20 years of being somewhat dormant. Uh, that uh, there's a government established that recognizes majority rule but appreciates minority rights. I think it's very easy for people who aren't used to democracy to get the idea of majority rule. I'm not sure it's easy for them to accept the concept of minority rights. But that, I think, is has got to be the key issue. And I don't think there's any uh, option for failure. And so you both are involved in something that I think is huge. And I would say to you, as someone who voted to go into Iraq with the great conviction that if in the end we fail to rebuild this country, uh, that the critics of my vote will in some ways be right. Um, would you tell me a logical reason why you would not want members of Congress to be in Iraq, uh, to understand the problem, to talk with people, to size up the problem, and um, to be able to, uh, as uh, leaders of a country, uh, be able to um, do our job of knowing how to provide resources and so on. Is, is there a logical reason that you can see why members of Congress shouldn't be in Iraq? There is not a logical reason except if there were uh, security considerations. Okay. Um, are you free to go to Iraq? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Is the press free to go to Iraq? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you think members of Congress should get their um, 
positions based on uh, what they see in the press, or should we try to get it firsthand, if it's we, possible? Uh, in Iraq and every place else in the world, we welcome uh, members of Congress visiting. Mr. Garvelink? I would agree. I think the, the only constraint would be the security situation. And there, I think, uh, while we're free to go to Iraq, there's some, if, if you're going for extended period, periods of time, there's certain kinds of training we're, we're still required to get before we go. Um, and I think everybody is. But I, I agree with, with Mr. Green. Everybody would welcome your, your presence in the, of members of Congress in Iraq to see what's going on and understand the programs that are underway there. The, the eight hours I spent in Iraq were the most vibrant eight hours I've spent in a long time. And everything I saw was not necessarily a surprise, but there were heightened degrees of I didn't realize this was here or not. So, I mean, I, it wasn't like everything was new, but everything I saw had an impact on me. Um, I was struck by the poverty. I was struck by, in this one town, the lack of roads. I was struck by the housing conditions. I was struck by the, the failure of having running water. Uh, I was struck by the fact that the gas station I went to had no, nothing there, nothing. It was just like a, a skeleton. And, and it made me appreciate how immense the task was. I was struck by the fact that when I went there, uh, and I saved the children were negotiating when they would bring in the fuel for the heat that they were having to debate with the uh, gas station attendant that there would be security because there was a concern that um, there was a concern that as soon as the uh, supply of, of this fuel came it would just be taken by a mob of people. Um, I, might, I might be able to see that on TV, but somehow hearing someone talk about it. Now, um, let me ask you, should I be surprised that neither of you knew uh, what form of elective government exists on the local level? Uh, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my focus has been uh, on, uh, on the relief Right. Efforts. I mean, if, I mean, I could have hazarded a guess that, there, of course, there wouldn't have been any democratically elected government locally. No, no, but I, I would just didn't not, know I that for I a fact. I would not want you yeah. to hazard a guess. Yeah. And, I, and, it's, and there's going to be things you don't know. Yeah. And, and that's not my point. I'm mm -hmm. just asking if I should be surprised. Uh, no, I think it points mm -hmm. to, the, the, at least for my part, yeah. uh, the, the lack of information about what was going on inside of Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I would agree. I, I'd, for the past four or five months or six months, I don't know quite how long it's been that we've been working on these issues, I think that a lot of folks have been working on a lot of different humanitarian issues and you focus on what you're doing. And, and I think Jay Garner gave a, a fairly good indication the task was a big one. One of the things we're doing in AID is trying to get 487,000 tons of food to people every month. That requires something in the order of 10,000 trucks a month. Um, you really got to focus your attention to, to make that, that work. So this was not one of the areas I've been focused on. Right, fair enough. Um, Abdul Hansen Mohammed, when I was in Ungasara, said to me, after he had pointed out some other concerns, he looked me in the eye and he said, you don't know us, and we don't know you. What, what, I know what it said to me. What does that say to you? He was talking about Americans and Iraqis. We don't know you, and you don't know us. What does that say? I, I just think it points to the uh, sort of the years of images we've built up about each other through uh, various discussions in the press and in the media. It points to a lack of direct contact between Iraqis and Americans on issues that are of importance to how people carry out their daily lives. And it points to how we have to get, resume that as quickly as possible. Uh, and, and would you just elaborate on that last point? Because it, it shows what they didn't know, and now it, you're stating an action. What do you think that action has to be? The action means that we need to get out and get into the country as quickly as possible uh, and factor in what 
what Iraqis want for their country and to understand what the problems are, to understand what they've been going through, to understand how they see solutions emerging. There has to be a huge Iraqi involvement in everything that we do, and the only way you get that involvement is to get out and get into the country and talk to people. Mr. Garvelink? Yeah, I would agree completely. I, the way, from your, from your own explanation, when you're in the country and see things, it's very different. Um, there are perceptions that both nations or both peoples have of each other that portions may be accurate, a lot of it's inaccurate, and until we work together and you know, start to understand each other's culture, we're never going to resolve some of the problems that are between us. You can't do that un unless you work hand in hand. When I was in the Peace Corps uh, in, in the South Pacific, in the Fiji Islands, when you went from one village to another, if it was on, on one of the smaller islands, you couldn't go to the other village through one village without stopping in. And if there were three villages along the way, you had to stop in every village. And you had to interact, you had to sit, you had to talk, you had to just go through these so-called niceties and kind of get to know each other. The next time, you would, be, could walk through all three villages to get to that final destination. And, and so I, I, I felt the same way that you're basically stating, that in order for us to succeed, we're going to have to get to know them and they're going to have to get to know us, besides our just trying to do good things for them. The, um, uh, and, and I'm curious as to how you think that happens. I think that goes hand in hand with the sort of a theme that we've had here in General Garner and part of your questions, it's improving the security situation uh, so we can get out and have greater freedom of movement. Uh, so when we do have this freedom of movement, it's not in uh, bulletproof vests and uh, heavy armored accompaniment uh, that we hold you know, normal, regular conversations with uh, regular Iraqi citizens. I mean, it's clearly what General Garner wants to get to as quickly as possible, and it's clearly what our entire team wants to get there as quickly, get to that as quickly as possible. Uh, I, I will tell you this. As someone who has observed General Garner, he is an easy guy to talk with. He's very unassuming, and I would think that the Iraqi people, uh, if they get to interact with him, would find him a very good man to work with. Um, that's just kind of my, my, not my hope, but it's, I guess it's my hope as well. I'd like another 10 minutes, but we're going to go to you, Mr. Jankalo, then we'll go to you, Mr. Roosberger, and we'll go. And Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be brief. If, um, a question was asked earlier about <clears throat> safety in the communities. As I recall, prior to the war, the government of Iraq passed out weapons to the general public, tens of thousands of rifles. Is, is that accurate as far as either one of you know? And I'm also under the impression uh, from at least from news reports I saw prior to the war that he emptied the prisons to a great extent and sent uh, the prisoners home. I've read probably the same reports you have about that, sir. To, to, to what extent do either of you think uh, one of our secret weapons uh, in, in this whole we, we don't know us and you don't know you thing uh, are the men and women of our armed forces? I mean, uh, there's a helicopter pilot from my state, we were just notified, was killed, um, rescuing a young Iraqi girl that had been injured by a landmine. Uh, I'm not aware that, that Saddam Hussein's military was known for those kinds of acts. I, I'm not sure that their military were known for treating individuals that were sick as opposed to just injured. I'm not aware that their military was known at least even even our media that some of whom don't like the effort weren't known for writing stories about how their military went in and mingled amongst the people uh, uh, fed them uh, transported them assisted them i'm just wondering whether and to what extent you plan on that being a a, a secret weapon if i can call it in the getting uh, to know each other routine the, the men and women of our armed forces have been incredible ambassadors for what we stand for as a country. Uh, and the more they get out, the more they get in situations where people can see what they're about and to see what our intents are, the better off we are and the more progress we'll make on this overall situation. I mean, they've been fantastic in every aspect of this operation. Let me ask you if I can. We've, we've seen the looting. 
But to my understanding, it hasn't involved private property. It's involved governmental buildings of one sort or another. Is that relatively accurate or not? There, th there's been uh, reports. I, I mean, I've seen plenty of reports of looting of uh, private property as well as uh, of individuals' homes. Yes, sir. I, I'm talking about the general citizenry, as opposed to the uh, the people that own lots of palaces and things like that. Uh, most of the reports that I've seen of general looting have been probably people with uh, a lot of wealth. Did you agree with that, Mr. Graveling? Yeah, I, I've. Uh, probably seen the same thing he has, and I, and the great majority of the looting that's gone on has been in government buildings. Both of you indicated it was somewhat of a surprise the level of the looting that we've all seen and heard about. What I'm wondering is why, if I can ask a question in general. This is a country where $20 in wages is is a significant is at least an increase over what people were getting. Um, it's a country where individuals didn't have, for all practical purposes from the testimony today, a water system that worked, a sewer system that worked, an electrical system that worked, schools where they had books for the students. Why wouldn't we think that where there's largesse out there, uh, the people under these circumstances wouldn't go after it as soon as they could? especially given the fact that they live in for, they'd live for decades under these kinds of circumstances. Uh, what I'm wondering is, why is this a surprise? Well, I, I think that the fact that there was looting was not a surprise. I think that the extent of the looting was a surprise uh, to the extent that uh, water treatment plants have been looted, uh, hospitals stripped bare, and uh, things like that. Yeah, I guess... Uh, I was quite surprised by the extent of it. Having spent a lot of time in Somalia and Rwanda um, and other places at the time when, when we were providing humanitarian assistance there, there was a lot of looting that went on, but I've never seen anything the scale of this. But in none of those countries do I think the government was overthrown by us when we were there. Here, well, here the government was gone and we were the new people in town. Well, that's true. I'm thinking of terms where just there was general, uh, well, in both, in Somalia, there was no government. Um, and the looting that went on just n never reached this magnitude. I'm, I'm not sure that, I, I don't know why it would happen. Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to take all my time with questions. I just want to say it's been three weeks since the general shooting has stopped. As late as a few days ago, we still had members of armed forces being killed. Um, it's, there have been phenomenal accomplishments made. I, I was sworn in on January 7th, and Congress didn't even come back till the end of the month. That was three weeks. And you got a lot more done in that three weeks than I did my first three weeks around here. So I, I, I think you've done an awful lot, and I think we've done an awful lot since January. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Rupertsberger. Yeah, we're talking about security, and I want to get into just a couple comments that were made. Uh, and let me say this before I get into these comments. It's very easy to criticize after the fact. The purpose of maybe the criticism would be to point out what we can learn so that we can make sure that we can do it better the next time. Um, after the President gave his, uh, his uh, speech about the mission accomplished, um, and it appears from media accounts and reports from uh, different non-governmental and some governmental agencies that we really were not, we did not sufficiently plan uh, for or implement security measures in Iraq to the extent they should have been, except maybe for the oil fields. Now, and as a result of that, we do have a lack of humanitarian assistance uh, and the pace still has not been where we need to be uh, because of security. And we do have to have security first. We can't put people's lives on the line, whether it's our military or, or the civilians or whatever. Uh, and also, I think, just to quote a couple, um, it, was a, it was an issue that I'm sure the administration wasn't happy about, but uh, the Army's Chief of Staff, General Eric Shazinski, testified by the, before the Senate Armed Services Committee that several hundred thousand soldiers, um, that over 200,000 soldiers would have been uh, necessary to maintain the security after we, the war was over. Uh, we have, and he, we, he also uh, was involved in the stabilization of Bosnia. Did you work with him at all? No. Okay. Uh, also, we have 
retired Major General William Nash, who commanded the uh, First Army peacekeeping operations in the Balkans in 1995. And then he also said that there needed to be at least 200,000 U.S. and allied forces to stabilize Iraq. Um, now, Wolf, uh, Secretary Wolf uh, countered Shazinsky, saying that he disagreed. And since the war um, was over, the Pentagon has reportedly reduced the number of troops from 250,000 to 135,000. Do you have any knowledge of that? No, sir. Okay. Now, if you did have, assuming that, that that is a reduction, would you have an opinion whether or not that is appropriate at this time based on the fact that there are security problems that exist which really affect the humanitarian assistance we can start giving the citizens and stabilizing the country? Would you feel that there needs to be more armed forces there? Uh, sir, I'm, I'm not going to comment on any force deployment decisions by the Department of Defense, and I'm only going to highlight that uh, every person associated with this operation at every level knows that restoring security is the highest okay. priority, and, sir, that currently there, there is no humanitarian crisis in Iraq. There are Did clearly pockets of need. Did I say crisis? I didn't mean to okay. say crisis. I, I take okay. that back. Humanitarian problem. Um, that exists. So my point is that if, in fact, it is necessary, there's a difference of opinion. That's always the way it is. It's just we want to try to get it right. Now, let me, let me go to some specifics as far as um, what we're doing with respect to the humanitarian issues. And first ask you, did we learn anything from what was going on and what is still going on in Afghanistan that might help us and dealing with the issues that are going on from a humanitarian point of view that might help us with respect to Iraq? Or are they two different countries and it's tough to, to compare? Well, yeah, I think, first of all, that the situations are quite different and it's, and it's tough to compare, compare the two. I think um, one of the lessons that, that uh, we're, we're seeing is that it's important to get out to rural areas and, and to work in the rural communities and to emphasize assistance there. We're trying to do that in both locations, and it was, it, it was made very clear that that's an important thing to do in Iraq. Right, let me ask this question. I think a lot that we have to look at, and I'm sure you have some expertise in the field, but what, what is our process of determining the types and amounts of humanitarian assistance needed for this post-conflict? I mean, we, we have to have a plan. What is the process uh, that we're looking at with respect to Iraq? Uh, I mean, are we, are we focusing on when we, we have the list that we, was given to us, but there are also some other issues. I think you have, you have different religious conflicts. You might have certain areas of the country that need, need to be targeted on where others might not. I mean, what process maybe that we've used in the past that you think is effective where we need to move forward? Uh, there is uh, an extensive uh, interagency planning process, process that's gone on for months in Iraq. Uh, General Garner talked about the uh, entire Orha operation. Uh, Ambassador Bremer has just uh, uh, gone out to Iraq to take over uh, his position. Uh, we get extensive information on assessments of needs by international organizations and NGOs. Uh, we rely heavily on those assessments. Uh, there's just a, a wealth of information that, that, that we tap into and, and use to, uh, to decide strategies. From a medical point of view, do, we, do you feel that at this point we're, we are getting the resources, both in, with respect to physicians and nurses or physician assistants or the, the drugs that are needed to help those people that are in need? Uh, where are we with respect to the medical um, option or the medical area of, of uh, this humanitarian issue? Yeah. Uh, I think we're doing quite well. Um, the, what we've done prior to the conflict is pre-position uh, medical supplies and equipment uh, in the region. We had uh, what they call World Health Organization WHO kits that could provide a basic, uh, ba it provides basic medicine and equipment for 10,000 people for three months. We had uh, enough of those kits to have uh, that kind of medical care for a million people in place uh, when, when the conflict started. So WHO kits were moved into Iraq with civil affairs units as soon as possible to health units and health clinics. Uh, when our teams actually could get into the country, they looked at these clinics and looked at, at hospitals and, ex and looked at more extensive uh, repairs that could be carried out. 
I think we're meeting uh, a lot of the needs of, of the health sector that we can reach at this point in time. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues that's, that's a concern is electricity because you have to have a constant right. source of power for the hospitals. And that, that's uh, improving, but that's been a concern. Do we have American doctors that are going over to Iraq and either volunteering their services or going over with fellowship or, <coughs> or other programs? Well, I, know I, we did, I know we did that in the Gulf War. Yeah. I, was, I was on a board of the a, of a University of Maryland uh, mm -hmm. shock trauma system where we had physicians sure. that were going. Do we have that program in place? Right on now. our teams that we have, meaning the USAID teams, we have four or five physicians um, in, in Iraq right now or in Kuwait. And I, th I think the, your NGO panel that's coming later will probably be able to talk specifically about, uh, about American doctors going back and forth. Uh, we, have, we have them on our team, but the NGOs would be better placed to answer that question. Okay. Unfortunately, I have to leave at 4 o'clock, so I'm uh -huh. raising the issue then. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for participating. I, I'd like to just go through another round of questions here as well. Um, I'd like to know how long we have been preparing for uh, the rebuilding of Iraq. When did humanitarian assistance planning for Iraq begin? Mr. Garmelink, you want to start? I'm trying to think of the, the exact month. I got into it a little bit later, uh, I think in October. Uh, my participation in the effort started in uh, late August, I think. Okay. Full time? Not full time, but a lot of time, a lot of meetings. Okay. Well, I know you work, I know you are both very dedicated public servants, and I know you work far more than 40 hours a week, but I, I really would like to get a sense of when this became your primary focus and responsibility. Became my primary focus probably with the first meeting in uh, late August. Okay. Okay. That's good. And, um, and, and, and what did that process entail? I mean, did it entail a lot of meetings? Did it entail a lot of contacts with people? What, how does one start to begin to, did it involve uh, contacting a lot of NGOs and saying, you all better get started here, we may be going in? It involved uh, participating with uh, Mr. Garvelink mm -hmm. and uh, many others on an interagency uh, planning team, talking about various scenarios, uh, trying to link up with possible military op options. Obviously, no decision had been made about the use of force right. then or for many months afterwards. Uh, it also involved uh, reaching out to international organizations, uh, trying to get an assessment of their plans and their requirements and trying to lash up our planning with their planning. Well, we all work for one country. Did you want to say something, Mr. Garvelink? Well, I was just going to say, I'd, uh, <laughs> we've spent a lot of time together in the past seven or eight months okay. in meetings. Uh, the other element to this is, is trying to determine budget requirements. Um, so the, but the, but we've the, both made a few trips to the region. Uh, to, to talk to countries there, so it's been. So the, the argument that somehow this is uh, uh, this plan to help rebuild Iraq it was put together and you know without a lot of thought or care is simply not true. I agree with that. Sir. Correct. Okay. Uh, a lot of thought and work has gone into the planning. Okay. Did the war end a little sooner? Uh, I mean, most of the combat sooner than you expected. Or was there this? think, my God, we got to be ready a little sooner than we anticipated? Was that a factor in this process? Uh, I don't think so. Our, we focused, I think as I said to an earlier question, on uh, a lot of our focus earlier on was getting ready for large population displacements. Right. And, and, then and that never happened. That never happened. And, but to get ready for that, we talked about prepositioning assets around the region right. Right. and doing what was necessary to be able to quickly move people into the region. So there was some preparation for something you never ever had to deal with, and that was a relief. Then there was some surprise that uh, some of the facilities became vulnerable and actually were a tempting target for looting, which was a surprise that you didn't anticipate in August, and I'm not sure I would have either, um, that, that you then had to do a little uh, um, getting caught up to speed? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
You're both from State Department. I, I get a little confused. AID doesn't like to say they're from State Department, so. I think technically we are separate from the State Department. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> I have to say that or I can't go back to work. Okay. Well, we'll say you're separate from, but you happen to come under their budget, and if, if Secretary Powell tells you to jump, you jump. Yep. But other than that, you're separate. Right. Okay. Um, but I'm not quite sure uh, whether I'm to view State Department as under the direction of DOD uh, as things stand now. In other words, uh, technically Mr. Bremer uh, uh, was with State, Ambassador with State, but his, his chain of command is through uh, the Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld to the White House. So are you technically working with the Department of Defense, uh, or do you view yourselves as working uh, not under the Department of Defense? I, I just uh, Clearly, the State Department is not working for the Department of Defense. Uh, Ambassador Bremer, as you point out, is uh, reporting to uh, Secretary uh, Rumsfeld, and we're working very closely with the whole ORAHA effort. We all have people right. at ORAHA. We're all, we're all trying to make it work, sir. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would our, our view of how this all operates is, is a country team approach. You, when an ambassador is in his country or her country, the, all U.S. agencies are represented there, and the overall uh, authority in the country is the U.S. ambassador, and that's the way we've, we've viewed this. General Garner, uh, Ambassador Brimmer is the overall authority there. We're all working under the general guidance of, of that individual. Mr. Bremer, you're working under the guidance of Mr. Bremer? I, I'm not sure where it stands at the moment with the, okay. with the shift, but, but it would be under the, the, the senior U.S. official in the country. Wouldn't you agree by your answer that there's a little bit of uncertainty as how this works, both of you? I, I, I'm, I'm not, these questions are not to put you on the spot, it's to understand uh, you both are doing a great job and, and I know that from many people who have spoken to me and knowing of your coming to testify. But the bottom line is, is, should I just view this as kind of a fluid situation a bit? But I mean, what I get nervous about is in my office, if three people have control, nobody has control. And in the end, I say, if, there, if something goes right or wrong, it rests with, and I pick somebody. Because I need to have one person ultimately mm -hmm. know. So uh, you both, uh, you report to your superior in, USA, mm -hmm. uh, in USA, mm -hmm. and you ultimately report to the Secretary of, of, of State, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, but you are working under the auspices of ORA and under the Department of Defense. And is that just kind of the way I'm to view it? No, sir. Okay. Uh, we are working uh, with ORHA in a collaborative effort. The people that are on the ground in Iraq are working under ORHA, report to, will now report to Ambassador Bremer, who reports to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, but here, back here at headquarters, uh, we're working collaboratively with the uh, Department of Defense on these issues. Okay. Yes, because the, 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 the perspective I was offering was from the field. I think, uh, Rich is right from Fair back enough. here. Um, what criteria does USAID use to gauge the capacity and success of humanitarian assistance organizations and their suitability as partners? That's your responsibility pretty much, Mr. Garbalink, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You work with the NGOs, and let me just editorially say, for me, they, the big heroes in this process are the NGOs. I mean, for me to see them kind of getting ready, they're in Jordan, they're in Cyprus, they're in, they're in Kuwait, they're, they, they do this all the time. They, they go to many places around the world where, where life is a danger. And they are pros, they are experienced people. Um, and you make them, it seems to me, you help them with the extraordinary resources you provide them. But they are absolutely, de you're absolutely dependent on them, I uh, gather, in order to accomplish the task that USAID needs to accomplish. Is that correct? 
Correct. We have a very close working relationship with the NGO community, and we're an agency that provides support to them, and our job is to facilitate their work. We, we do not implement our humanitarian programs. We rely primarily on the NGOs to do that. And that's a policy that over the last 10 years, that's a shift in policy over the last 10 to 15 years? Was no, there, I think for AID that, that's always been their approach to, to providing humanitarian assistance is through the NGOs. Okay. My sense was that we squeezed down the number of people in aid, USAID, and, and that you became more and more dependent on NGOs to accomplish the actual operational tasks, but that's not true. Well, I, I'm, I'm looking at it from the humanitarian side of AID, and we've always been kind of small, okay. and uh, we've yeah. always been reliant on the NGOs. Fair enough. The, the, so getting to my question, what criteria does, do you use to gauge the capacity and success of humanitarian assistance organizations? Well, I, I, the organizations that we work with, we know and have worked with for a long time. And so we know their capacity for management back at, in their headquarters. Uh, we travel frequently to the field and, and look at their programs, talk to them, uh, plan their programs. One of the issues that's just a, a very fundamental one is the, the accounting structure. That's a, that's a requirement to, to handle U.S. government funds. So all of these NGOs certainly have that capacity. And in our working with these NGOs, and I, as I have for over the years, you get to know the strengths and weaknesses of each organization. Because you've worked with them in so many parts of the world? All over the world and for, for me for the past 20 years. I mean, is it conceivable that uh, five NGOs are going to compete for the same grant? Or do you have so many grants right now there's not this kind of competition? Are you running out of NGOs to do the work, or are they NGOs running out of money to get from you? Uh, neither. Okay. Um, I, there, there's resources to go around to, to fund the NGOs. And I think the way uh, we have divided up, if you're speaking specifically of Iraq, we have six cooperative agreements with, with major NGOs to work in certain, certain parts of the country and provide a whole range of assistance. And under the circumstances right now, that seems, seems about right. Would you explain to me, um, the NGOs will tell me why neutrality is extraordinarily important. Would you both, uh, Mr. Green, you, you get involved with the NGOs as well in this community? Yes, sir. Yeah. Would, would you both explain to me, in your words, why you believe neutrality is important? Neutrality. I think impartiality is important. I'm not so sure that I would put neutrality in that same category. Um, and I think Iraq may be a good case. We're, we're not neutral in Iraq. We're, okay. we're the, the issue is, are, are these NGOs to be an instrument of the United States government, or are they, are they an instrument of their own organization to do good works uh, using the resources of the U.S. government. And, and uh, they would argue that they can't go into a place um, as an instrument of the U.S. government. I would accept that, and yeah. I don't think we that's would... how they meant the word. That's how I meant the word. Neutral. Okay, I, we do not view the the NGOs um, as an instrument of the U.S. government. Uh, we view them as a partner in providing humanitarian assistance. And they have expertise and skills and characteristics that the U.S. government does not have. We're not there for that long a period of time. We're not on the ground. Uh, we don't know the people like they do. And, and they have to maintain a certain independence from us. And that makes sense to us. And it makes sense. Mr. Green? I, I agree with that, sir. And I'd also add that there's many cases, in most cases, there's a confluence of objectives between what NGOs want to have happen and what we as a U.S. government also want to have happen in terms of responding to humanitarian uh, distress. You know, I think you both have extraordinary opportunities. I, I think you're, if I could say it this way, I think you're doing the Lord's work. And one of the things that, that moved me deeply when I got to go into Iraq was, I, I looked at these NGOs as we were having a meeting uh, in the base, uh, the British base at the port, and I was thinking, these folks devote 80 hours plus a week. They're not, they're, they're not, re their remuneration isn't what it might be in some other business, 
but they are doing extraordinarily good things with the resources, in many cases, of the U.S. government. And uh, they do it with a lot of courage, frankly. Uh, when we went in, there was the argument that there needed to be someone guarding me, and the uh, Save the Children's folks said, we are not going in under any uh, protection, uh, military protection. And, and, and the explanation was because they have to go in as a neutral force. And I thought, they do this all around the world. And I just pray that we use them well. I just, one last area, I'd like to know if you believe that we should be, excuse me, I should, this is a policy issue, so I don't want to put you on the spot this way. Um, how do you react to the argument that the, the UN has, first let me ask you this, how did you react to the fact that the UN seemed reluctant to end the embargo? Uh, I don't uh, accept the premise that the UN was reluctant to enter Iraq. Uh, I, know UN, I know that UN relief agencies were doing everything possible to get into Iraq okay. uh, and are now in Iraq and gathering storm and gathering uh, momentum. Uh, and, and I also these are very skilled people, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. And they also provide the overall coordination structure that the NGOs will plug into. Their their presence and coordination is essential to this process. Well, that's that's very important to put on the record. Mm -hmm. In other words, we need their network or, or their system in order for the NGOs to be successful. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You agree with that, Mr. Yeah, I uh, I think. Th the various organizations that we work with all have particular skills and strengths. And the UN is very important as the overall umbrella to humanitarian operations. Its presence is critical for dealing with house governments and setting the stage for what the rest of us do. And that's, that's uh, no one else can play that role. And we can't operate without them. I had this feeling if I didn't have the job I have right now, I'd love the job that both of you have. And you might say I'm crazy because I maybe don't understand uh, what keeps you up at night. Uh, but um, I would think that you're doing very important work. Uh, the success of our nation's endeavor depends in large measure on what you do with the people that you work with. And um, the impact uh, in the region and ultimately on the world, to me, uh, rests uh, with, your, uh, with your good work. So. Not to put a burden on you, um, I hope to God you, fi you succeed with flying colors. Do you um, have anything you want to put on the record um, before we go to our next panel? Uh, no, sir. Only that we uh, greatly appreciate your support. Well, you have it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you both very much. Appreciate it a lot. Our final panel is uh, Mr. Curtis Welling, President and CEO of AmeriCares. Uh, Mr. George C. Biddle, Senior Vice President, International Rescue Committee. Mr. Rudy Von Bernuth, uh, Vice President and Managing Director, Children in Emergencies, Emergencies and Crisis, Save the Children. Mr. Kevin uh, M. Henry, Director, Policy and Advocacy, Care. And uh, for uh, nothing but honesty in government, I would like to disclose that two of these witnesses, and with some pride, disclose that two of these witnesses uh, organizations, AmeriCares, and Save the Children are based in the 4th Congressional District of Connecticut. I'd ask unanimous consent to insert the following documents into the record. A letter from Dean A. R. Hirsch, President of World Division, stating they will not be able to testify, and, and written testimony from Mr. Bill Freelich, Refugee Program, Amnesty International. Without objection, uh, so ordered. And I'm going to ask all of our four witnesses to stand. Do we have four witnesses? We do. Gentlemen, I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long, but it's great to have you here. If you'd raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No, for the record, all four of our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And we'll go in the order that you're sitting. And uh, do a really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Mr. Welling, uh, you need to boom that mic up and turn her on. And All bring right. it up. Yeah, that's great. Is that better? That's wonderful.
Uh, thank you, Congressman Shays. It's a pleasure and honor to be here to discuss our experience in providing emergency medical assistance in the context of the war in Iraq. AmeriCares is a privately funded disaster relief and humanitarian aid organization. For 20 years, we've been providing rapid humanitarian response to disasters worldwide in the form of medicines, medical equipment, and other shelter and relief supplies. Over that time, we've worked in 137 countries, and we've been involved in virtually all significant disasters for two decades, including earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, as well as man-made disasters in places like Rwanda, Kosovo, and Afghanistan. To date, we've delivered uh, more than $3 billion worth of humanitarian assistance. And we stay after the disaster is completed. Last year, we provided ongoing humanitarian medical assistance in over 50 countries around the world. Our model stresses speed, careful needs assessment, the identification of strong local partners, leveraging cash donations with in-kind contributions to maximize volume and impact of assistance. Our donors responded immediately and enthusiastically to the crisis in Iraq. To date, we've raised over $700,000 in cash and over $10 million in in-kind contributions from a broad range of America's pharmaceutical and medical companies. Despite the logistical difficulties and impediments that one is confronted in this situation, I'm happy to report that the model has worked in Iraq. As a result, on April 23rd, we were able to move 20 tons of critical medical supplies overland through Turkey into Erbil and Kirkuk. We are told that's the first distribution of emergency medical assistance of any consequences in that part of Iraq. More recently, uh, just this past Sunday on May 11th, uh, in Aleutian 76, a plane not of our manufacture, uh, with 40 tons of medicines and other critical supplies landed in Baghdad, we believe that was the first NGO flight of emergency medical supplies Did into... Did you fly in that plane? Uh, I didn't, although I expect to go in one soon. Okay. And um, those medical supplies uh, are being distributed as we speak, pursuant to an assessment that had been going on on the ground by America's personnel for the preceding week. Uh, we're planning another airlift of equal size, uh, about 40 tons, uh, for the 22nd of this month. And, Congressman, I'm here to tell you, pursuant to the question you asked earlier, if you would like to go with us, we would be happy to have you accompany us on that trip on the 22nd. Despite these missions, we all believe that this is just the beginning and we expect to be working in Iraq for a considerable period of time. And despite the fact that these are early days, we have learned much from our experience. One of the unique things about this situation is that we had time and a great deal of information. And that's not the norm in a disaster context, as you know. So there was time to plan and organize. There was time to consider the very substantial amount of information that had been produced by the NGOs and the multilateral organizations on the ground. We knew the war would cause significant incremental deterioration. We knew it would require massive effort. And very importantly, we knew that America would be judged in part by how well we met the challenge. And reflecting that, the President made a pledge on behalf of the American people to provide immediate humanitarian assistance. Notwithstanding all of these things, the time to plan, the information, the understanding of what was at stake, and I have to say, notwithstanding the good faith efforts of hundreds, if not thousands, of people in and out of government, our experience causes us to conclude that there are things that we could have done better. The first thing that we learned was not to trust or be complacent about our assumptions, but to question and plan for contingencies. Uh, the government and the non-governmental world widely anticipated a refugee and displacement crisis, perhaps of historic magnitude. In the event, happily, that crisis never materialized. However, substantial redeployment and retooling of the planning was required as a result of that planning assumption. The lesson is that contingency planning and flexibility are critical given the extraordinary complexity of the situation. But of all the lessons we learned, and our learning continues, two stand out to us as particularly important. First, we think it's critically important to designate and empower a central point of authority at the highest level. I want to say that again because we, we believe it's so important. We believe it's critically important to designate and empower a central point of authority at the highest level. What I mean by this is an authority which is clearly in charge, an authority which can speak with clear, unambiguous, and authoritative voice, which can cut decisively across departmental and organizational lines to direct, facilitate, communicate, and control, and to ensure that efforts are planned and not duplicated or frustrated because of turf, confusion, or red tape. Clearly, this was not done. Many organizations were created with lots of acronyms, 
But in our view, if there was ever a need for a government czar empowered at the highest level to oversee planning and execution of a cri critical government priority, this was such a time. In our own case, the absence to cut through some of this red tape was particularly dramatic. The fact that it took us 24 days to receive OFAC and UN 661 approval, which approvals had clearly been rendered moot by the stunning military success of our armed forces. While that time we waited on the Iraqi border with 65,000 pounds of critical medicines and supplies was both frustrating and deeply troubling. The second key lesson we take from this crisis is that planning and preparedness are crucial, and we've heard much about planning and preparedness in the discussion so far today. Simply put, it's our view that the resources committed to planning and preparation for the humanitarian response were not well coordinated, were not transparent, and didn't match the magnitude of the challenge nor the importance of success. Consider, if you will, as a counterpoint, the experience of the journalist community and the resources committed to facilitate an unprecedented level of access and media coverage. Giving credits where it's, where it's due, the Defar Department of Defense did a remarkable job in anticipating and finding creative ways to plan for and manage the process, down to the reporter's boot camp. The same level of preparation, planning, and transparency could have been employed with respect to post-conflict security and humanitarian assistance. Such a thoughtful commitment would have facilitated better coordination, earlier access for evaluation and analysis purposes, and clearly would have facilitated a speedy transition from military to civilian control. While I'm not sure if humanitarian boot camp is the appropriate characterization, the same rationale is valid. Creative planning, transparency, and preparation under the direction of a central point of control are critical elements for success. To those who argue that the situation is too complicated, I respectfully disagree. The greater the complexity of the crisis and in the resource coordination problem, the geometrically greater the need for thoughtful planning, modeling, and one person to be held accountable. Finally, let my, me conclude my remarks with a word about safety and security. Much has been made and reported about the reluctance of non-governmental organizations to work under the direction or protection of a military force. And as you, you have observed, different organizations will accept different boundaries in this context. This is a valid and important issue, and it's important for this body to recognize it as such. The reluctance of NGOs to work under the control of a military power is appropriate. One of the first principles of humanitarian assistance is neutrality and independence. It's a cornerstone of our reason for being and a source of much of our credibility. In order to maximize the effectiveness of the humanitarian response, this principle must be acknowledged and respected. It's as simple as that. No one doubts the need to have military in control of all activities during the period of active hostilities. Further, it's clear that for a period of time thereafter, the period in which we now find ourselves, all parties are acting under the security umbrella provided by the coalition forces as an occupying force. This is correct. It's also the coalition's responsibility. I'm pleased to tell you that in our own activities in Iraq so far, we have received superb coordination from the military units we have dealt with in Iraq, both in Kirkuk and in Baghdad. Simply put, however, it does not seem at the policy level that a high enough priority was given to providing security arrangements to, to facilitate access of humanitarian aid organizations for evaluation and, and assessment purposes. Obviously, this is an important consideration in an environment where speed, days, and weeks desperately matter. Our future response in future contexts will be compromised to the extent that these principles are not well understood or accepted. Once again, we thank you for the opportunity to share these views with the committee today, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Welling. Welling. Uh, Mr. Biddle. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? There we go. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak about humanitarian assistance following military operations overcoming barriers. I have submitted my statement for the record and will take this opportunity to highlight the critical actions that should be taken to overcome barriers and best ensure that humanitarian activities in Iraq and Afghanistan will be carried out successfully and effectively. They include, number one, protecting civilian populations and establishing a secure environment. Number two, obtaining the greatest level of international legitimacy and support by defining a clear role for the United Nations. Separating, and number three, separating military and humanitarian efforts. Delaying or not carrying out these act actions can have profound consequences for the successful delivery of humanitarian assistance after military operations. Protecting civilians and establishing a secure environment. 
If you ask the United Nations and the humanitarian and human rights non-governmental organizations in Afghanistan what the greatest obstacle is to Afghanistan's rehabilitation, they all give the same answer, lack of security. The UN Security Council supported establishment of the International Security Assistance Force in Afghanistan following the war. To date, 5, 000, to date the 5,000-member force has deployed in and around Kabul, but not to the other regions of Afghanistan. The need to enhance security because of the multitude of threats is critical to the ability of aid organizations and the UN, as well as the government of Afghanistan, to deliver assistance to communities in need. I recommend that you read the May 6th report to the UN Security Council from Lakhdar Brahimi, the Secretary General's Special Representative in Afghanistan, which gives an unvarnished view of this acute problem. There are a number of efforts underway to address the security crisis in Afghanistan, including demobilization, demobilization of combatants, decommissioning of weapons, the creation of an inter-ethnic Afghan national army, and the establishment of a national civilian police force. Beyond strengthening these efforts, the real issue at hand is the critical need to extend the International Security Assistance Force beyond Kabul to assist the government, the international community, and local and international NGOs to meet the real needs of Afghan citizens. NATO is due to take the lead in ISAF this summer, and we hope that NATO's involvement will be more robust and more effective in disarming the warlords, securing the borders, and creating an environment for the central government to develop and govern beyond Kabul. NATO can add Excuse me, NATO can aid the national army in securing the countryside and protecting the Afghan people. A firm NATO mandate in Afghanistan is critical to that country's future, especially in advance of national elections in 2004. The threats to security in Afghanistan and Iraq are eerily similar. They include insecurity in the aftermath of war, desire for revenge and retribution, ethnic and sectarian divisions, displaced populations, factional competition, and interference by neighboring countries. There are currently over 200,000 U.S. forces deployed for Iraq. At present, they are unable to maintain effective law and order, and there is no administration of justice. Under the Geneva Conventions, the coalition is legally responsible as the occupying power to protect civilians, including restoring law and order, basic due process, and judicial guarantees. The upsurge in violence and crime in Baghdad, the looting of hospitals, and the recent violence in Fallujah all speak to the urgency of this critical issue. The Iraqi people are not accustomed to this level of chaos and crime. They are becoming increasingly scared and angry and are beginning to lose confidence in the coalition's ability to do what it said it would do, restore electricity, water, and sanitation services, rehabilitate hospitals and clinics, and meet the critical needs of the populace. The coalition must comply with international humanitarian law and do more to protect Iraqis from the looting, lawlessness, and frontier justice developing in the center and southern regions of Iraq. Civilians are asking coalition forces for more security and protection measures. Shadow secur security networks are now emerging. Tribes, villages, ethnic groups, mosques, communities are banding together or around leaders to man armed neighborhood watches and administer on-the-spot justice. This will only develop and spread in the absence of legitimate security authorities and make the work of humanitarian actors more difficult. If the coalition doesn't get a grip on the situation quickly, they will find themselves in a dire situation. Temperatures are reaching close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in parts of the country, and outbreaks of waterborne disease like cholera, which recently appeared in Basra, will become more widespread. It is urgent that the security environment be addressed immediately so that the coalition doesn't lose the peace. Obtaining the greatest level of international legitimacy and support by defining a clear role for the UN. Since the fall of the Taliban, the UN, has been an the UN has been an integral leader in providing humanitarian assistance as well as developing a transitional administration in Afghanistan. At the Bonn Conference to decide the transitional administration and loyal Jirga process in Afghanistan, the UN effectively facilitated the overall post-conflict effort to ensure peace and improve the welfare of Afghans. Once the Afghan interim administration took office, the UN assistance mission in Afghanistan, known as, by its acronym UNAMA, was established in Kabul to support and provide technical assistance to the interim administration in meeting humanitarian and protection needs. Another critical role the, US, the UN has played is to rally the donor community to meet Afghanistan's needs. In Iraq, the coalition continues to go it alone and has just indicated its support for a clear UN role. The International Rescue Committee, together with other NGOs, has called on President Bush to turn to the UN to lead humanitarian efforts in Iraq. The World Food Program and UNICEF have worked in Iraq for the last decade, 
and the UN has managed the oil for food program, the largest single relief effort in the world for the past 12 years. UN involvement will help to coordinate agencies, international donors, and local and international NGOs, and will encourage burden sharing by the international community in meeting the needs of the Iraqi populace. A UN role will also ensure the independence and impartiality of humanitarian assistance in a way that no occupying, occupying power can. This will enhance the trust of national and international actors, which is critical to a successful humanitarian effort. A clearly defined and leading UN role in the relief and reconstruction of Iraq is also necessary for the development of civil society. In many towns and cities, Iraqis are beginning to form city councils and reinvigorate civic organizations. To date, it has been the coalition forces, specifically the civil military operations centers, that have encouraged and at times even co-located with fledgling, fledgling city councils as they begin to address key issues such as water, sanitation, power, education, and health services. Yet for all the good intentions and even early progress, the City Council's military association may have a divisive and discrediting long-term effect in the eyes of many Iraqi civilians wary of occupation. According to an IRC senior staff member just back from six weeks in the region, a sustained military role in the development of Iraqi society to the exclusion of the United Nations may well be self-defeating. In An Nasiriyah, for example, some key community groups, such as a women's volunteer association composed of education and health professionals, are intentionally staying away from relief and reconstruction efforts perceived to be military-led. This is a critical time for Iraq and its nascent civil society. It is imperative that structures be put in place that encourage maximum civilian participation. A clear and robust role for the UN can help bring Iraqis together to develop the practices and institutions necessary to ensure a free and democratic society. Lastly, just a few points on the separation of military and humanitarian efforts. The blurring of the lines between military and humanitarian operations is of the utmost concern to the humanitarian community. It is important to understand the humanitarian community's perspective on the reasons why UN authority and civilian oversight of humanitarian activities is so important. And in my remarks, I'll echo what my colleague has just said. First, the military should do what it does best, fight wars and provide security. And humanitarian organizations should do what we do best, care for civilians and deliver assistance to those in need. Second, humanitarian assistance must be provided on an impartial basis to ensure that all civilians in need, regardless of race, creed, nationality, or political belief, have fair and equal access to aid. The UN is clearly more independent and more impartial than any one party to a conflict and there should, therefore should coordinate and direct relief efforts. Although the Pentagon's Office for Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance is currently heading the humanitarian response in Iraq, the IRC and other humanitarian organizations have been assured that our efforts and implementing partnerships remain with USAID and the State Department. This distinction while critical to the provision of aid in this circumstance is a dangerous precedent and one that calls into question the motivations as to why, how, and where humanitarian assistance is provided. This concern is shared by other NGOs and many in the international donor community and will likely become a greater concern of local Iraqi communities over time. For NGOs such as the IRC to work effectively in a post-conflict setting, we must establish a close and trusting relationship with the communities we serve. To do so, we must be seen and known to be impartial and independent of any military force. Lastly, confusing military and humanitarian activities carries great security risks for those delivering assistance. Our safety often depends on local perceptions. Aid workers are obviously not armed, cannot defend themselves, and must never be mistaken for members of the military. Their lives depend on it. The humanitarian agencies respect and appreciate the critical role the military plays in establishing the security after conflict, and we are grateful for it. But because of our commitment to impartiality and independence and the critical need to develop a trusting relationship with the communities we serve, we cannot accept military supervision. This is a challenge we are facing in Iraq. As a result, we have had to add conditional language to our grant agreements with USAID to ensure traditional civilian reporting structures. If this trend continues, the space for humanitarian agencies will shrink and fewer will be involved in responding to crises such as exist in Iran and Afghanistan. Donors from other countries will likely refuse to coordinate and cooperate, and the result will mean fewer people in need will receive the services they so desperately require. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Biddle. Mr. Bon, uh, bon Bernath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for providing Save the Children the opportunity to testify before your committee. I want to thank uh, 
especially you, Congressman Shays, for your leadership and support of Save the Children's work in Connecticut and around the United States and in more than 40 countries around the world, your recent visit, which you've referenced several times, to our programs in Iraq and West Bank and Gaza, and your subsequent support for the Women and Children in Armed Conflict Protection Act are greatly appreciated by myself and all of my colleagues. Save the Children has been active in the Middle East for more than 30 years. We're committed to addressing the ongoing needs of children and their families in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as those in need around the world. My comments today will focus on three points regarding the role of non-governmental organizations in post-conflict settings. The lessons we've learned from Afghanistan, the barriers that we're encountering in Iraq, and finally, the solutions that we recommend for overcoming these barriers in Iraq and in future conflict situations. And I will try to lightly edit my remarks to uh, eliminate too many repetitions of what George has recently said. Um, in 1985, Save the Children established its Pakistan-Afghanistan field office to respond to the needs of an estimated 3.5 million Afghan refugees then living in Pakistan. We expanded our work to Afghanistan in 1989. We opened our first offices in 1993 inside of Afghanistan, and we've been working there ever since throughout the Taliban period and afterwards. In the year following 9-11, Save the Children delivered approximately $25 million worth of relief and reconstruction assistance in that country. Uh, in Afghanistan, the Agency Coordinating Body for Afghan Relief, or ACBAR, of which Save the Children serves with CARE, IRC, and other major NGOs, has articulated the following two key points about the role of NGOs working in Afghanistan. The importance of a secure environment for reconstruction, the necessity of long-term funding commitments for Afghanistan. Indeed, these two key issues and the failure to address them currently compromise the prospects for um, an Afghan recovery. Let me address each of them. The importance of a secure environment for reconstruction. Security and protection are vital to the work that we do and to the reconstruction and development of Afghanistan. Because of the international desire to support the notion of a successful interim government, the fragility of the political and security situations today tend to be underplayed by our government and in representations to the international media. Let me assure you that anyone who has staff on the ground in Afghanistan today knows that there is no question but that security is tenuous and is getting worse. In Kabul, the biggest risks today are terrorist acts and armed robbery. Um, and George has already talked quite a bit about the role of uh, ISAF and the need to expand that role to provide a secure working environment throughout the country. Anecdotally, I would just mention that outside of Kabul in the north, where Save the Children conducts programs, the tensions between the political parties seem to be on the increase, and where politics fail, security also fails. For example, and this is just one of a number of incidents over the last year which have affected our staff, on April 8th, following the appointment of a new civilian government, governor, tensions between Jamiat and Jumbash troops came to a head, resulting in two days of heavy fighting and three days of sporadic fighting. A Save the Children international staff member based in the town of Maimana was evacuated along with others in a convoy of UN and NGO staff on April 9th. As of April 17th, an unexploded rocket-propelled grenade was still lodged in the wall of the house of one of our national staff members uh, who was waiting for deminers to remove it, a reminder of the continuing risk posed by the conflict. So bottom line. We need the U.S. government to support efforts to ensure security and to recognize that this requires an external presence in order to succeed. Point two, the necessity of long-term funding commitments for Afghanistan. We've learned from our experience in Afghanistan that the only way to ensure development success is by ensuring long-term funding that provides the bridge from emergency humanitarian assistance to sustainable community-based development programs. And yet, we are woefully behind meeting the funding levels agreed to in the Afghan Freedom Support Act, and we are seeing an increasingly dangerous situation for NGOs working in Afghanistan. From the start, the money pledged to Afghanistan did not compare well to other post-conflict situations, for instance, the countries in the Balkans. Even more serious, those commitments have not been fulfilled as donor aid has fallen far short of the Tokyo pledges. 
Among my colleagues in the field, we are see seeing a general sense of progressive disengagement by our government towards the Afghan people, having seen U.S. interest and commitment to Afghanistan wax and wane several times over the last decade, Save the Children calls on the U.S. government to make commitments on a multi-year basis. The United States and other countries need to keep faith with Afghanistan and stay the course with substantive and sustained support if we hope to achieve a sustainable peace. Working in Iraq, Save the Children currently has 26 expatriate staff, most of them now in Iraq. Uh, Congressman Chase, when you were there, many of them were still in Kuwait. We've received a $10 million award from the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, part of aid, uh, and have also allocated over $100,000 in private funds to support our agency's work in Iraq. Initially, Save the Children has provided assistance uh, in UMCASAR, cooking gas distribution operations, uh, in, uh, to hospitals and, and clinics in Az Zubair, and preschool education kits uh, distributed in Safawan. Um, on an ongoing basis now, we've established a main program office in Basra last week, and we now have a dozen ex expatriate staff based there. We have done initial assessments in Karbala and on Najaf, and we will begin setting up programs and offices in both of those gubernaturs uh, next week. I have more detailed information in my written testimony on our programs there. Roadblocks and solutions to providing humanitarian assistance in Iraq. The primary obstacle to providing humanitarian assistance right now, as everybody else has said, is security or insecurity. The lack of security has created an arc in our anarchic situation where citizens cannot access basic services such as education and health care. Our team in Baghdad says that parents are not letting their children attend schools because roving criminal bangs, gangs are kidnapping children from local neighborhoods. Consequently, schools are operating at 30 percent of normal capacity. People are also not visiting health clinics or returning to work because of the lack of order. <coughs> Many ministry employees are still unable to go back to work, uh, uh, and ministries are closed. Employees often are stopped by U.S. military at the doors of the ministries because the military can't distinguish who are employees and who are looters. Um, further, as has been mentioned by everybody, including General Garner, government salaries must resume so that people can get back to work. These employees and systems, the, the systems they run, will ultimately be responsible for feeding, educating, and vaccinating the Iraqi people. Point two, the U.S. military must move quickly to establish a functioning police force that can restore order. Until basic order is restored, life-saving humanitarian assistance cannot be delivered with the speed and the quantity that is now needed. Many of our European allies have experienced police trainers who are skilled in providing policing and at training local police forces at the same time. Kosovo provides a good example of this sort of policing support provided by NATO members. I think it's also important that the Department of Defense understands the very delicate cultural and political issues at play and the way in which our military performs in communities throughout Iraq. I have just heard an alarming report from one of my colleagues who yesterday met with senior Shiite clerics in uh, Karbala, where he heard tremendous anger and concern about the way U.S. tanks had rolled up next to some of the holiest Shiite shrines and their fears that this could spontaneously erupt into some sort of a bloodbath. <clears throat> we need experienced leadership that knows how to deal with these sensitive cultural and political issues. The, U the U.S. military has done a great job of winning the war, a job they have trained for. Now is the time to let people trained and experienced in rebuilding societies do the job that we have been trained to do. <clears throat> um, in Iraq, even before the outbreak of the war in March, women and children were facing very severe risks and unmet protection needs. These risks have now risen. Protection from sexual violence and physical harm is one of the six critical protection needs measured in our recent um, State of the World's Mother's Report. According to yesterday's Washington Post, the dark accounts of kidnapping, rape, and sexual abuse of women and children are only likely to increase. Our Iraq team is also seeing many children harmed by unexploded ordnance. 
The clearing of unexploded ordnance must be stepped up, and education of children on avoiding them also has to be stepped up. We're concerned that neither in the initial Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance awards that some of us at this table received, nor the more recent request for application from AID for community re rehabilitation, has women and child protection been listed as a prioritized project activity. The U.S. government and NGOs must prioritize the protection needs of women and children in the onset of our humanitarian response. Finally, Save the Children supports an expanded role for the United Nations for post-conflict uh, reconstruction. Again, to summarize four key recommended solutions, the U.S. must move quickly to establish a functioning police force that can restore order, and we probably need European expertise to accomplish this. The differentiation between the roles of humanitarian workers and the military must be made clear. The U.S. government and NGOs must prioritize the protection needs of women and children at the onset of our humanitarian response, and the role of the United Nations in post-conflict reconstruction must be expanded. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before this committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Henry, and then we'll get to the questions. that mic on Henry. Mr. Henry. Okay. Is it on now? Yeah, now okay. it is. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for inviting CARE uh, to participate in uh, today's hearings. CARE International has been working continuously in central and southern Iraq since the 1991 Gulf War. As the last panelist, I have the challenge of saying something that hasn't already been said, and uh, I'm not sure that I can do that. Uh, I'm pleased to say that what I will have to say coincides largely with what my colleagues have to say, despite the fact that we had no opportunity to coordinate our, our testimony. I will focus my testimony on the efforts of CARE and other humanitarian organizations to deliver assistance in Iraq today, the context in which we are operating, and our recommendations for priority action by the United States government. I will also, like my colleagues, highlight critical lessons that need to be learned from our experience in Afghanistan. The central reality in Iraq today is that a vacuum has developed in a country that was for decades completely docked uh, dominated by institutions that now no longer exist. The Iraqi government, led by Saddam Hussein, the Ba'ath Party, and the Iraqi Security and Intelligence Services. A swift military victory must now be followed by an equally effective response in filling this vacuum. Failing to do so could prove tragic for the Iraqi people and very damaging for the international credibility of the United States government. What is required of the U.S. government is obvious and straightforward. Restore order, reestablish essential public services, and set in motion a process that will allow the Iraqi people to rebuild their country and establish a le legitimate government. I say straightforward, and while it's straightforward, the magnitude of the challenges that we face in doing all that is required in Iraq is enormous and we should not underestimate those challenges. So the question is, what are the priorities? General Garner, in his testimony today, did David Letterman one better and came up with Levin uh, on his top uh, you know, list of things that need to be done in Iraq. Uh, we're a little bit more realistic, perhaps, or a little less ambitious, and we would focus on four priorities. The first, I think we all absolutely agree, it was number one on General Garner's list. All my colleagues have raised it. It is that immediate action must be taken to restore law and order. While the Iraqi people have no desire to return to the police state that was Iraq under Saddam Hussein, they are urgently calling for a restoration of security. Many Iraqis are still afraid to venture outside their homes, especially at night, and most parents are still unwilling to send their children back to school, fearing for their safety. And the lack of security is already having a very detrimental effect on the ability of care and other humanitarian organizations to do our work. Just since the end of the conflict, CARE's warehouse in Baghdad has been looted. Just this past weekend, 
two of our cars have been hijacked. Over the last few days, we have had to send international staff that we just recently deployed into Baghdad back to Amman for their own safety. So that's a measure of our sense of the uh, security problems in, in Baghdad. Um, you know, as, as one of my colleagues in Baghdad said today, what does it say about the situation when criminals can roam freely around Baghdad and humanitarian aid workers cannot? Unless law and order can be reestablished promptly, there is a risk of a rapid downward spiral in the humanitarian situation in Iraq, and civilian relief agencies will be in no position to respond. Establishing security throughout Iraq must be priority number one of the U.S. government, and the assets required to accomplish this objective should be deployed immediately. The other three priorities on our list, and I will go through these very quickly because they have been touched on and they actually figure near the top of General Garner's list as, as well. Uh, first is the restoration of electricity, water supply, and waste treatment. These services are essential not just because of their tangible benefits and impact on the health system, but also for the positive signal they would send to the Iraqi people that life is returning to normal. Secondly, and here I would take issue with the testimony of our colleague from USAID, we fear that the health system in Iraq is in danger of complete collapse unless urgent action is, is taken. Uh, we've all, we all saw the, the, you know, the footage of hospitals being looted Anyone who's visited the hospitals in Iraq today know that they are struggling to cope with a very difficult situation. So uh, we, we think urgent action needs to be taken to prevent a co complete collapse of that system. Finally, uh, we were pleased to hear uh, General Garner report on progress being made in making emergency payments to civil servants. We think that's very important. We think that should be expanded uh, immediately. Uh, it's important to remember that in Iraq prior to the war, the Iraqi government was by far the largest employer. So getting civil servants, getting money back in the pockets of civil servants not only allows them to do their important jobs and support their families, it helps get the Iraqi economy going again. Uh, like my colleagues, I also believe that it's extremely important that we learn lessons from our recent experience in Afghanistan. And I fear for the most part that these lessons are not uh, yet being very well learned. Uh, I, I would highlight briefly four, um, uh, four lessons that I think are most critical. First is, following regime change, priority must be given to establishing nationwide law and order as a basis for economic reconstruction and political transformation. Regime change, by definition, creates a security vacuum. If it is not filled by international peacekeepers and new national security forces, it will be filled by less savory forces, including criminals, warlords, terrorists, and drug traffickers. One and a half years after the end of the war in Afghanistan to unseat the Taliban and defeat al-Qaeda, a large portion of the country remains insecure. Despite repeated calls, the U.S. government and the rest of the international community have failed to expand international peacekeepers beyond Kabul. Current U.S. government strategy in Afghanistan, which includes the deployment of small provincial reconstruction teams and the very slow training of a new national uh, army uh, are simply, in our judgment, inadequate to the task. And we urge Congress to ensure that similar policy mistakes are not made in Iraq. Secondly, post-conflict reconstruction is a long and costly undertaking, requiring sustained commitment from the U.S. government and the rest of the international community. There, I would only say that although the U.S. government has been very slow in the case of Afghanistan to get off the mark, there has been progress recently. Congress did, despite President Bush's failure to make a specific request for funding for Afghanistan in this year's budget, Congress has appropriated money and Congress has appropriated additional 
additional resources in the Iraq Supplemental, and we congratulate you for doing that. The Iraq Supplemental also already has $2.5 billion in relief and reconstruction funding for Iraq. We, we, we view that as a good down payment on what will be a large-scale multi-year effort. Thirdly, establishing an international framework for managing post-conflict situations like Afghanistan and Iraq is in the best interest of those countries as well as the American taxpayers. The people of Iraq and the eventual new government of Iraq will need all the help they can get financial aid, technical assistance, trade and investment, and debt relief in rebuilding their country economically and politically, creating a framework that enjoys the widest possible international support is thus vital. Like my colleagues, I believe that that necessitates a major role for the United Nations. Finally, the last lesson for us in Afghanistan, and it's been alluded to not only by members of this panel, but by uh, Congressman Shays as well, is the issue of civilian leadership. And we urge uh, a transitioning as quickly as possible to full civilian leadership and control of relief and reconstruction in Iraq, because we believe that will encourage the widest possible participation of U.S. and international humanitarian organizations in those efforts. The military's expertise is in the security area, and that should be their focus in Iraq. By contrast, most experience in relief and reconstruction resides in the civilian branches of the U.S. government, the United Nations, and humanitarian NGOs like those testifying here today. Also, as we have learned the hard way in Afghanistan, it is vital that the military respect the need for humanitarian organizations to be seen as impartial and independent and that they do nothing to blur the distinction between military and humanitarian action. Organizations like CARE work in many very dangerous situations. The safety of our staff largely depends on their reputation uh, for uh, in local communities as unbiased providers of humanitarian assistance. And I was reassured to hear the dialogue between Congressman Shays and, and Mr. Garvelink on that point, reaffirming the importance of impartiality. In conclusion, I would say this week's news from Baghdad is unsettling. <coughs> The Saddam Hussein regime clearly is no more, but in its place a security vacuum has developed. Clearly the team of U.S. officials tasked with governing Iraq in the interim is also in a state of flux. A high degree of insecurity coupled with confusion as to who is in control make Iraq a difficult and dangerous place for humanitarian organizations to work. We urge the President's new Special Envoy for Iraq to accord highest priority to the establishment of law and order throughout Iraq, as that is the foundation on which economic and political reconstruction must be built. If that is done, we can work to ensure that the basic needs of Iraq's 24 million people are met and a humanitarian crisis can be avoided. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. We've, we've heard uh, four excellent statements. It's constituted over 40 minutes, and uh, but there will be questions. But it's been uh, it's been very very helpful, and it's been a, a very wonderful panel in its statements. Um, Mr. Jankelo, you are governor. You're on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Biddle, I, I couldn't help as I listened to you and read your testimony pick up a, what I thought was a somewhat of a difference between you and and the other three panelists, especially with respect to the, if I can call it the primacy of getting the United Nations uh, involved as opposed to having the United Nations involved. Do you understand the distinction? And I'm just wondering, did I pick up something incorrectly or do you feel that strongly about the United Nations? No, I think it's a question of uh, clarity um, in terms of the role. Um, our previous panel, uh, Mr. Green referenced the fact that the UN uh, agencies, humanitarian and, uh, uh, and the humanitarian arms of the U United Nations, such as the World Food Program and WHO and others are, tr are beginning to return. But I think it's important as well that the coalition make clear that they would welcome that in a more specific fashion so there's an understanding of the coordinating role in providing relief, uh, which will help to facilitate an understanding at the community level that this is a, a, a coordinated, international, impartial process to rebuild um, and it, both address acute needs as well as to rebuild uh, 
the, the infrastructure and the society. And you know, help, help me if you would, sir, for a second. I, what, what I don't understand is that um, where, you, where you have, let's just say that your organizations directly deal with the people and the UN's not there. And I'm not suggesting that not be the case at all. But uh, I, I, do they really care who gives them or provides for them textbooks, gets the electricity turned on, gets the water functioning, um, gets the garbage hauled away, brings them the security, and assists them in getting food for their families? Does it really make that big a difference to people? I think it does from the perspective of civilian uh, interaction. Where uh, else has that been the case around the world, uh, an example of that? Well, I think if you, if you take a look at many different um, uh, crises in, in the world community, you'll find that the both uh, two points, I think, that are critical here. One is the role, uh, the coordinating role that the UN plays in working both with local NGOs, international no, no, organizations. No, no, excuse me, sir. You're I'm talking sorry. about the local community level where now, you I'm interface. I'm wondering where people have reacted negatively to those people that are providing them assistance with respect to food, clothing, health, uh, education, medical care, and housing uh, when it's provided by a government as opposed to, or, not, or NGOs as opposed to the UN. I think it depends on the political context in which it occurs. And I think what we're trying to do in supporting a clear role for the UN in leading and coordinating humanitarian relief here is that we don't give sucker support to those parts of a, of a given society. It can be any group. And obviously, there are a number of factional forces at work in Iraq that could perhaps. I'm sorry, uh, sir. What, what I'm asking, I hate to interrupt, but I'm yeah. trying to be very focused. Can you cite to me anything historically? or anecdotally, where it has been a problem, where NGOs or a government have provided elsewhere in the world food, clothing, education, health, or, or, or housing, and it's been perceived as negative uh, by the recipients. I mean, I'd have to uh, think about that for a minute to come up with a specific example. I think the, it, the issue that we're looking at, though, is well, the overarching I understand the issue. Context. I understand the issue, sir. I'm just wondering, because I, I sense that there, there was an, maybe what I perceived to be an over-reliance on, on the UN as opposed, and I'm not knocking the UN. I think they do marvelous work. I, I happen well, to be I the mean, son of a lady who was in the Somalian group that was slaughtered, um, uh, with the charitable workers, the, the Filipino-American group uh, that was slaughtered uh, as missionary nurses. And so I, I have some appreciation for what your various organizations do in various places around the world. But again, uh, let, me, uh, let me ask you if I can, uh, Mr. Henry, do you, how strong do you think it has to be the UN as opposed to uh, agencies like yours and all the others from our country and other countries? Clearly, we don't have the only NGOs in the world. There's a lot of them. The primary role of the UN in playing that coordination and facilitation role, and also, very importantly, in mobilizing resources. Even with the UN programs, the NGOs do most of the heavy lifting. Okay, But in, in our estimation, if the U.S. government wants to mobilize the widest possible participation of the international community in providing peacekeepers, in providing funding for reconstruction, then the U.N. is the vehicle that will get that broad support. So, I mean, setting aside all of the, the philosophical reasons from a purely practical point of view, I think that's the best reason to involve the United Nations. What is it? Uh, if I can ask you this, recognizing that we're, it's three weeks since basically the war ended, and, and, and but for a few individuals uh, I th you know, who, who may have known better, I think most of us uh, think it really went very quickly mm -hmm. um, and with, a, with a, an incredibly small amount of damage to the civilian infrastructure, uh, given the enormity of taking over a whole country that's one of the most armed in the whole world. You know, and I hear about like people being upset that the tanks are parked next to a mosque, but they had to be terribly upset when they had Fayyadeen, several hundred of them in Bag Baghdad in the mosque, shooting at the soldiers that were coming um, through the community. And, and the arms that we found in the schools 
can't have made any mother feel well about sending their children to school, given the walls that have come down and what we found behind those walls in, in a lot of the school systems. And so I, I guess what I'm asking is, do, do you folks think we were that unprepared for uh, what have your organizations been doing getting ready for this? Is it just the government that was unprepared? And let me ask you, Mr. Welling, well, what, what did you do during the months that you thought we were leading up to this? Um, well, I, I think everyone was, um, was working in their own way to prepare in our own case. When did uh, you start? In our own case, we started uh, in February. And as I think I mentioned in my written testimony by um, Prepositioning uh, March, we prepositioned a substantial volume of, of supplies. I, I think there's a point here to be made about the volume of planning versus the coordination and the quality of planning. I don't think there's any debate about the fact that each of the organizations and each of the agencies that had a potential role in what is now the, the post-war environment was spending a lot of time planning. Um, when a division of labor becomes fragmentation and redundancy, I think is an important question. And so one of our observations would be that absent the central point of control that we've talked about, that there was a lot of planning going on, the, that it wasn't necessarily going on in a consistent way, and it wasn't necessarily being done in a way that maximized the potential contributions of each of the organizations. Mr. Biddle, when did your organization start planning for the fact that you may end up in Iraq providing substantial assistance? We began preliminary discussions at headquarters in July or August as we saw the uh, possibility of... Uh, and, and you, Mr. Bemuth, your organization? Uh, we began in the early autumn, and we did a planning workshop in Jordan in December to prepare staff. And, and you, Mr. Henry? Uh, similar to Save the Children in the fall of uh, last year. And, and I realize the, the, you know, the UN assists in coordination, but is there ever a point in time when all of your organizations or some of them and others sit down with each other planning for going into it? And, uh, I assume you're all basically in sort of the same business. At least you have a lot of overlapping in terms of what you do. Some of you are faith-based, some of you are not. But you know, I think all your hearts are in about the same place when it comes to what it is that you do. Do you ever sit down and plan with each other over who's going to do what? There, there's been extensive coordination among our agencies and, and many others. I mean, prior, to, yeah, specifically as, with respect to Iraq. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, USAID provided a $900,000 grant to what was termed the Joint NGO Emergency Preparedness Initiative, which was set up in Amman, Jordan, and included care, save the children. When was that done, sir? That was, uh, I think that was initiated in uh, the late winter. I think it was probably March, uh, February, March. Of, of this year? Yeah. The, what I'm trying to get at is how much planning did our government do preparing for the eventuality they may have to be providing substantial humanitarian assistance on the ground in Iraq at some point? I think if I can respond to that, sure. I think one of the issues was a lot of the planning was uh, classified, so it was difficult for us to know exactly what they had in mind. I think everyone had anticipated a, a larger displacement crisis and were thankful that there wasn't one. At the same time, there were some impediments to uh, the kind of planning that humanitarian NGOs traditionally do, which are on the f on the ground assessments and prepositioning uh, of supplies, as well as relationships with local communities, and those were hindered by the uh, presence of uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions, the OFAC restrictions on our being there. Sir, I noticed in your oral testimony you talked about the fact of cholera having appeared, and, and the concern of that. And, and you, Mr. Bemuth, in your testimony, I believe it is, I read where it's been endemic in. Iraq in rural areas since 1991. So it doesn't appear to be something that's, that's new. It may be new in some areas, but it's not new on the scene. Um, w what I'm wondering is, is that with respect to the assistance that, uh, that has to be provided, what's, what's the biggest surprise that you folks have encountered? I mean, I can't believe that y y all didn't think security might be a problem. Uh, are there any of you that were shocked, it may be the magnitude, are there any of you that were shocked that security is a problem three weeks after the uh, occupation of a country? No, I mean, the, the only thing that I would say surprised me was the looting specifically of hospitals and facilities of that nature. The, the more general looting wasn't a surprise, but that it would extend to hospitals surprised us, and that, that, that is uh, definitely complicating matters. Mr. Behemoth, what was your biggest surprise for your organization? I think it's been the 
slowness to get access to get into places even in the southern part of the country that had been uh, bypassed or liberated early on in the war, and then the, uh, the difficulty of uh, developing local staff. Uh, almost all of us depend tremendously on local staff in all the countries we work in to succeed. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with the exception of CARE, which had a previous basis in the country, the rest of us didn't, and therefore that's been a surprise how difficult it's been. Mr. Biddle? I think the, the issues we've had to face were in our own preparations for, uh, for, the, for the responding to the humanitarian needs and that we couldn't get access earlier, we couldn't develop local partnerships, and now, of course, we can't move as freely in the country as we'd like. Uh, so those you, are you and Congress, huh? <laughs> Well, it, it's field travel. Um, obviously, we'd like to be able to uh, get into Baghdad a little more effectively. CARES had a long-standing presence there, but our staff have had trouble getting from our northern locations down there because of security concerns. And, and very briefly, you, Mr. Welling. Uh, our biggest surprise, our biggest surprise was the extent to which, uh, for all this planning, uh, the questions of access were not were not better thought out and more transparent. Uh, and I would also add that, um, with respect to the pre-existing conditions that we have found when we got there, um, the fact that the condition is pre-existing doesn't diminish its um, uh, importance in terms of providing uh, humanitarian assistance. So that would be a relatively low standard for compliance to restore things to pre-existing conditions. Mr. Chairman, conditions. can I ask one quick question, please? May I please do that? I'll be, and I'll be brief. In, in your planning up to this point, um, did you ever, prior to the time the war was over, was there ever a time when your NGOs sat down literally with our military talking about h how we would proceed when the war was successful? Because I don't think anybody ever doubted the outcome. So given that fact, was there ever a planning session or coordination between you folks and the military as to how you would proceed once the war was over? I mean, I can answer. I know there were many discussions in Washington through the interaction uh, consortium of humanitarian agencies uh, to meet with officials at DOD to discuss um, what our views of, of the search situation uh, were at that time and what they might become as a result of the war. One of the issues I'd just like to go back to is the security situation. Um, our Vice President for Government Relations here in Washington issued a paper in January and then testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, on this issue, going through the various um, threats to security in Iraq as a result of of, uh, of a war there and the fact that we would be in a, a position to be responsible under the Geneva Conventions as the occupying power for law and order and protection of civilians. That paper, protecting, protecting Civilians from the Security Vacuum, I'd like to make available for the record. I think it would be uh, very interesting for you all to see, and we did share that widely with the U.S. government at the time uh, when it was issued in January um, and also presented it uh, at the hearing uh, in May, excuse me, in yeah. March. I, I just on the subject of exchange of information with the military. Without objection, we'll make that part of the record. Thank you. Now, I, I would just uh, like to say that there were any number of meetings that NGOs participated in with representatives of the Pentagon. Uh, on the whole, as my colleagues have said, our ability to get information was hampered by the level of secrecy and confidentiality of the planning within the U.S. government, much we didn't find out until very late in the game. And in general, with the Pentagon, their idea of information exchange was you know, NGOs, give us all the information you have. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we'll call you if we have anything to share with you at a later date. I am loving this panel. And I have so many questions I'd love to ask. But I'd love to um, have you tell me if you agree or not or want to elaborate or whatever with Bill Freelix testimony that we put into the record, who is the uh, humanitarian assistant. This is from Amnesty International. He's the director of Re refugee program. This is the paragraph. If you listen to this paragraph and tell me if you agree with it. For security reasons, UN agencies themselves were not able to establish offices in Iraq during the first critical weeks. This created a circumstance in which the NGOs inside Iraq could not establish connections with UN agencies, but only with DART teams or ORA, making their ties to the occupational power stronger. The UN Humanitarian Coordination for Iraq, uh, Rom Romero Lopez de Silva, moved into Baghdad on the 5th of May. NGO 
so will be watching closely how the Kuwait-based Humanitarian Operations Center, run by U.S. military and civilian forces, will be af affected by the establishment of the U.N. coordinator for humanitarian assistance inside Iraq. If there are two competing centers of humanitarian coordination with significantly different objectives and principles, each with its own resources to bring to bear, humanitarian assistance could become paralyzed. Let me just tell you how I comment, and then I want to go to you, Mr. Welling. My sense was uh, kind of the more the merrier. And I'm missing something here that, that I don't understand about the system. And I, and I gathered that the UN somehow has, over time, has become the, the structure in which NGOs kind of fit in. So, um, Mr. Welling, do you have a comment on what I read? I do. Um, I think, um, perhaps by way of clarification, I, I certainly agree from a capacity standpoint that your observation that the more the merrier in terms of the aggregate resources that can be brought to bear is a desirable thing. Clearly, that creates coordination problems. And I think one of the issues that we're all groping here with is the fragmentation of the parties that had responsibility or thought that they had responsibility for a piece of the activities and uncertainty with respect to who had responsibility for the totality of the activities. And if it was ORA, it wasn't clear that it was ORA. And if it was the UN, it wasn't clear that it was the United Nations. And uh, to our way of thinking, in fact, that uncertainty persists today. So I would say capacity uh, maximization is an important thing pursuant to an intelligent assessment and a coordination of capacity so we don't see, for example, some of the things we saw in Kosovo where tons and tons of medical supplies had to be destroyed because they were redundant or inappropriate. Okay. Mr. Biddle? Yeah, I think there, uh, I've had conversations with officials at the UN who were confused as to what role they should be playing. There's the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs at the UN, which tends to try and coordinate both the UN agencies and bring the NGOs in in cooperation with donors. And their role has been somewhat confused at the field level, both um, in terms of how NGOs interact with them, as, as well as their interaction with um, uh, other uh, bodies related to the U.S. government, if it's Warha or others. I have seen that in the draft resolution uh, that was at least put forward uh, um, in the press uh, to the UN, there was an attempt to begin to clarify the role of the UN in that, in that role. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, thing that needs to be, uh, clar needs to be pushed uh, from the U.S. perspective to make sure that there is an understanding of what uh, they will be doing and how they'll interface both with the U.S and the coalition uh, uh, efforts to uh, reconstruct and rehabilitate. And would you care to t say how you think that should be? That what well, we've been on the record and we've written to uh, President Bush saying that they should be the lead coordinating right. body in uh, bringing uh, both humanitarian and longer term reconstruction. Which is consistent efforts. with your testimony, right. Mr. Mamluth. Uh, A couple comments. One, uh, Yes, the UN was late getting into uh, the country, but on the other hand, there had been an active dialogue in Larnaca and Jordan and Kuwait uh, between UN agencies and NGOs, so it wasn't that there wasn't a lot of discussion going on. Secondly, we almost always do have a problem in emergencies with multiple foci in terms of direction. Usually it's a donor working group on the one hand and the UN on the other hand. Um, but lip service, at, use, at least, is usually given to the UN as taking primacy in terms of that coordinating role. Thirdly, in practical terms, if you look, for instance, at education, um, uh, UNICEF can play a very constructive role, for instance, in bringing together um, multiple donors who will support a UNICEF-mandated education reform package, multiple NGOs who regularly work with UNICEF, and government officials within Iraq who will feel comfortable working with a UN agency in a way that a bilateral donor or government is not going to be able to do. So there really is a special role that the UN can play, for instance, in organizing the education sector or organizing the health sector that a unilateral donor will not be able to do. Thank you. Mr. Henry. Uh, yes. Uh, we, CARE has uh, made uh, an effort from the beginning to coordinate very actively with the United Nations, and despite their lateness in arriving in, in Baghdad, we have been coordinating with them closely, primarily in Amman. Uh, if, if we're critical of anything, it's, it was their decision to originally base their operations in Larnaca, Cyprus, which was too far from the scene when most NGOs were, were actually either in Jordan or in Kuwait. Um, in terms of the role of the UN, I, I mean, I think, you know, what it comes down to at the end of the day is two things. One, who sets the priorities? 
right? The, the more the merrier, yes. But, but at the end of the day, in something like this, there have to be priorities. Someone has to set them. And, you know, you do have the potential for two competing frameworks right now, the ORHA framework and the UN framework. And that is potentially problematic. And secondly is who will... And, those, and, and they differ? Sure. I mean, one is a U.S. government, Pentagon-managed structure, and the other one is... I know is the structures are different, but do their goals differ and their, and their objectives and so on differ? Well, I, I, I think, uh, I think both, both sides would probably, you know, you ask them, but I think both, both the Pentagon and the United Nations would probably say that, you know, once you get beyond the very high-level goal of rebuilding, right. you know, Iraq, they, you would, they would disagree on, on a lot of things. Would I think. you all agree with that really quickly? I mean, Mr. Muth, Nuth, you've said... Uh, I'd agree. Yeah. Mr. Biddle? I'd agree, and there are going to be micro and macro issues. There's the large-scale mm -hmm. issues, and then there's going to be uh, what uh, a UN agency or body might see at uh, a community level versus what uh, another agency, uh, a bilateral or, in this case, a U.S. government agency might see. Thank you, Mr. Well, do you agree? I don't have anything to add. Okay. Did, Mr. Trinity, I interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, no, just uh, the final thing is What's very important in these kind of complex emergencies when you have so many actors is there has to be a forum and there has to be a framework within which we all interact. And the question is going to be who, who's going to provide and create that framework. So, you know, at the end of the day, NGOs will do a lot of the work, you know, with funding from the UN and from the U.S. government and other donors. But the, the existence of that framework and that forum is is vital for our efforts in making sure that there aren't major gaps on the one hand or big overlap and, and duplication. Yeah, I, I came with a bias that, that maybe is so off base that you need to cor correct me on. I came with a bias that the, the UN takes so long to make a decision that basically uh, we, it, it, you just can't wait that long. So I came with this decision that if the U.S. military did it, it might be three years, and if UN did it, it might be seven. Um, or more, you know, whatever. But what I'm getting a sense from your testimony is they, they go into automatic pilot. There's not a lot of decisions that go back to the UN that take a long time to be decided. Is that correct? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but disavow me of my, of my misconception here or, or confirm it. Well, I, I don't think it's necessarily a question of, um, of time frame. I think it's a question of experience and expertise. Uh, I think that the point that's been made before about expertise and division of labor, I think, is a valid one. And the UN has it. And the UN, UN has it, and they have the expertise. And I also think the important point from a U.S. taxpayer standpoint and from an aggregate capacity standpoint is it's simply clear that the United Nations has access to donors on a basis that no unilateral organization is going to have. The United States government will not have the same access to donor resources that the United Nations would have on some of these programs in education, health care, and infrastructure re okay, re rehabilitation. Enough. Mr. Biddle, anything to yeah, add to that? I, I would echo that. I mean, well, I think the, the burden-sharing aspect is critical um, because uh, donor governments are going to participate if they view it as an international effort as opposed to the effort by one, two, or, or a small group of governments. And the expertise factor is a given in that. There's no question that the UN is an international body, and sometimes things will take longer in working through it. But from the perspective also of the current situation in Iraq, the military and the other efforts of, of the U.S. presence in the field is going to need to be directed, especially at this time, to providing a secure environment. So you're also dealing with capacity. You want to allow others to come in and share in the uh, relief and re rehabilitation efforts. And the U.N. is the best vehicle to ensure um, an international cooperative effort. Mr. Van Venuth? The U.N. in the aggregate certainly can be slow and cumbersome, and many times has been. But the agencies that we're talking about, UNHCR, World Food Program, uh, UNICEF, uh, have each of them a particular mandate, a particular set of interventions that they've worked on in a number of other crises like this. They've worked in the Balkans, they've worked in Afghanistan, et cetera. And uh, the people that they're bringing in to work on the ground are people that many of us have worked with in other crises. And uh, I think they can be reason reasonably efficacious as well as bringing in a far broader spectrum of uh, supporters. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Anything to add? I, I think you know, the UN is, is imperfect, as are all uh, institutions created by man, but, but they have a role to play. And if they put some of their best people uh, you know, uh, in, in the field in Iraq, they can play a very important role. Uh, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that, that um, 
Mr. Wallen, you, you were the most forceful on this about the need to designate an, uh, a central authority. And um, you talked about turf battles and so on. Uh, can the, and before I, I go to Ms. Maloney, who's joined us, can, can I envision a UN being a major participant without the, the United States losing its ability to kind of take some definitive action in terms of humanitarian efforts? In other words, will the U.S. have to give up as they invite the UN in? You know, I don't, I don't see it as a zero-sum game. In I, think, other words, yeah. I don't think there's any sense in which the United States would have to compromise its interests. Right. You made the point several times during these hearings that with respect to goals, broad-based objectives, the objectives of the humanitarian community and the objectives of the American people and the British people are the same objectives. I think this is a question now of uh, effectiveness and efficiency. The war has been won. There's a, a set of tasks that need to be accomplished, and we should be about identifying the parties who are the most competent to, to uh, accomplish the tasks on the table. Anybody have something to add to that before I go to Mr. Ms. Maloney? Well, it's, uh, I'm going to want another shorter round, but Ms. Maloney, you have the floor. Then thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, and I, you all represent extraordinarily important organizations that have really uh, responded to world crises in the past. I, I, I believe that our, our government is working very strongly with the United Nations. In fact, uh, we are funding them. Uh, USAID has provided $1.2 million to the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance to support several initiatives in Iraq, including the Humanitarian Information Center. Uh, so we are working with them. I, I'd like to ask each of you, to whom do you as a non-governmental organization involved in assistance programs in Iraq report. Who do you report to? Do you report to this Humanitarian Information Center? Do you report to the United States government, USAID, or to your board of directors? Who do you report to, uh, Mr. Henry? Uh, well, yes. I mean, first and foremost, as uh, a non-governmental organization, we are accountable to our board of, of, of directors and our mandate and, and mission uh, as an organization. Now, of course, working in a context like Iraq, we're subject to whoever is, you know, the the powers that that, that be in, in any given context. So who do you report to? In well, Iraq? we don't report to anyone, but for instance, we have accepted funding from the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and one of the issues that we have worked to clarify is we've said, look, in that context, we will report to the Disaster Assistance Response Team, which is part of OFDA, and that we do not want to and will not accept reporting directly to, to the military. Mm -hmm. So as regards well, are, U.S. Are, government funding, we are reporting to and accountable to the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, which is a part of AID and, and under the Department of State. Mm -hmm. Well, are you reporting to the United Nations Humanitarian Information Center to let them know what you're doing so that they can coordinate? Because now they are funded by our government to help coordinate. I'm, I'm wondering, have you interacted with we're, them? We're, we're actively interacting with all of the specialized agencies of the UN. We're working particularly closely with UNICEF and the World Food Program because our programs focus on water supply, sanitation, food, mm -hmm. health. So that's that's the main the main players really in Iraq for the United Nations today are the specialized agencies such as UNHCR, the World Food Program, UNICEF, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they're the people we're working with. Uh, the coordination folks have literally just arrived in, in Baghdad in the last week or two and really haven't fully gotten uh, up to speed. Although you have been supported uh, by USAID in the past, did your funding increase uh, dramatically recently because of Iraq uh, to respond to this problem? Uh, not dramatically, but we, we have received uh, assistance. We have received care, uh, a grant of $4 million which we understand could go up to as much as $10 million for uh, immediate relief and reconstruction activities, including in the water supply, sanitation, and health sectors. Okay, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Mr. Von Bermuth. Mm -hmm. uh, we've received a mix of funding. We have right now received funding from Norway, the British government, uh, USAID, 
uh, through an instrument similar to the one that Mr. Henry just described, uh, the World Food Program and private resources. Uh, mm -hmm. In regard to the utilization of each of those monies, we have a reporting obligation to the donor. Uh, mm -hmm. Overall, in terms of our overall program, I would not say that we report to any of them. Uh, I would say as a, a member of the community, we have an information sharing responsibility, uh, both with ORHA in, in, in Kuwait mm -hmm. and when it gets underway with the UN uh, uh, OCHA coordinating mechanism mm -hmm. in, uh, in Baghdad. Uh, but it doesn't constitute a report to, okay. it constitutes a share information with and collaborate with. Well, as uh, one who works for our children, save, um, save the children, and I, I think they're probably the most vulnerable. I've read about children being kidnapped, being blown up by mines, um, uh, just terrible uh, parents not wanting their children to go to school because of the turmoil and the fact that they do not believe security is there. And when the U.S. government is withdrawing troops, um, who do you call when you have a security problem? Who do, you, who do you call when you you find out that there's such turmoil in a certain area that children cannot go out in the street? Is there a phone number you call? Do you call the military? Who do you call for security for the children? Uh, that's a very good question. We have all of us today in our testimony uh, basically said that uh, as the occupying power in Iraq today, we would call on the United States government to ensure that adequate police services are in place, security is in place, so that people don't need to worry about leaving their homes and don't need to worry about sending their children to schools. But there's, there's turmoil. I, I, I have numbers I can call in New York when there's a security problem. There, there is no 911 in There is Baghdad no 911. No. There is no police department. There is no place that you can call and that, say there's turmoil right. in this particular school. And that's one of the reasons that children aren't going to school mm -hmm. and even why many women are now staying at home and allowing men to go out and do the shopping and what have you. There's real, especially in Baghdad, a real fear uh, on this insecurity level. And I, I, I uh, support the United Nations for many, many reasons, one of which is burden sharing. And uh, I just came from a hearing on, on uh, financial services where we're talking about the deficit, we're talking about uh, the trade deficit, the growing deficit, and the economic uh, challenges that we have in our own country. And I, I, I'd like to know, what is your USAID commitment, and did it come grow up or grow because of Iraq, uh, Mr. Von Bernuth? Uh, the Iraq inst uh, instrument that we received represents $10 million, um, and it's a short-term instrument all to be used within this given fiscal year. Um, we about 50 percent of our total funding comes from the U.S. government, mostly from AID, and mm -hmm. that represents about uh, $85, 90000000 million a year from the U.S. government, so this represents a tenth of it for this mm -hmm. fiscal year. And um, how long do you think you'll be in Iraq? Is there any timetable that's been given to you? Or this contract you said was for a year, but are they saying it's going to be a continuing contract? Do you have any sense of how long you'll be in Iraq? The current U.S. contract we have is for uh, six months, actually, not for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we've been offered the opportunity to bid on a, another contract, which would be for, I believe, a year, possibly extendable to a year and a half. So the U.S. government, in terms of its funding, is looking at fairly short-term instruments right now. I think mm -hmm. we strongly believe that the commitment in terms of work in Iraq has to be on a much more multi-year basis. Rebuilding a society isn't going to take place in six months or a year, so we would hope that we would be able to work with the Iraqi people for a number of years. I gave the example earlier of Afghanistan, where we've been working in Afghanistan since 1989. We stayed through the Taliban period, and we're still mm -hmm. working there. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen U.S. government funding instruments wax and wane during that period several times. Well, we're hoping uh, that other uh, citizens of the world community will uh, donate not only to the United Nations and donate to Iraq, uh, but donate to organizations such as the ones that you represent. Are foreign governments coming up and contributing or, uh, to, the, to the effort, or is our country carrying the whole burden? Well, CARE, CARE, I can say, is receiving funding from the Australian government, the UK government, the European government, the Norwegians, the Canadians, and That's the great. U.S. And mm -hmm. we're also working with the, both UNICEF and the World Food Program. So there is an international effort. But what about Mr. Bernuth with the uh, Save the Children? 
I, I mentioned earlier that we've received funding support so far from Norway, from DFID, which is the British government equivalent of AID, uh, uh, from uh, the World Food Program, and uh, there, we currently have proposals pending with Finland and Canada. That, that's terrific, and I'd like the same questions, if I could, uh, from Mr. Biddle and Mr. Welling. Uh, what is the U.S. commitment? Has it grown, grown larger? How long is the commitment for you to be in Iraq? And are other nations uh, coming to help you? And, uh, I, and also going back to the Humanitarian Information Center, it seems if we're funding someone to, to somewhat coordinate information on humanitarian uh, efforts with the U.N., it, it seems that, like all of you, should be sort of in there sharing information so that you some there's a central place you said we need a central place possibly this could serve as a central place to share this information no, we're, we're actively uh, in touch and coordinating with uh, the UN uh, OCHA folks on the ground as <clears throat> as well as with other NGOs and in, in locations that we um, operate in and uh, with any other bodies that are um, working including obviously local communities which mm -hmm. is the critical mm -hmm. um, uh, group that we need to work with to ensure that we are both reaching the most vulnerable populations and building in a mechanism to sustain our work past our involvement. We also received um, uh, a, a cooperative agreement um, to respond to humanitarian needs in Iraq from U.S. Agency for International Development's mm -hmm. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. In our case, it was a $5 million cooperative agreement for six months. Uh, we have not um, applied for further funding at this stage. We're going to watch to see how the situation evolves, whether our services will be needed over the long term in Iraq. There have been uh, large, I think, requests for proposals uh, put out by USAID for longer term uh, work, which we uh, declined to apply for uh, at the time. Uh, and in terms of European or international support for our work, I just came back from a visit to some of the European capitals and uh, some of the uh, funding uh, agencies in Europe. And a lot of the questions I got were uh, specifically um, wanting to know how we were going to operate in an impartial fashion. Were we being directed uh, by the U.S. military? And what assurances could sure, we absolutely. give to some of our traditional donors that, in fact, we were maintaining our own standards and our own uh, uh, commitment to our principles of being uh, both impartial and responsible to ourselves um, in assessing and delivering services in, on a needed basis. And I should come back to, Mr., uh, to uh, Congressman Janklow's question specifically. I was trying to think. Nothing came into my mind at the time of your question. But in the case of Colombia, um, we've had uh, some local partners in, uh, in Colombia that have refused to work with us if we had U.S. Uh, government funding, not because they were opposed necessarily to U.S. policy or the money itself, but because it actually endangered uh, their operations, they could be seen as a potential target from a particular group, be it a paramilitary force or one of the guerrilla forces for whatever uh, view that that funding may, um, how it may be perceived at the, at the local level. So it's a question of perception sometimes as much as anything. And one of the reasons I raised the UN to begin with is the perceptions in some communities in Iraq that they may not want to work with the U.S. because it's directed, uh, directing the assistance in a, with a particular goal in mind that um, may be not necessarily uh, accurate, but uh, unfortunately can uh, add to confusion as to what the objectives uh, of an assistance program are. Well, all of you represent, uh, in many ways, uh, truly international organizations. I, my time is up and the chairman is going to continue, but I, I did want to let you know, Mr. Biddle, that we had a fundraiser for your organization yesterday in the district that I represent. Oh. So that I hope that that will be helpful, more helpful in your efforts. And I Thank congratulate you. all of you. and, and uh, and we're all praying for you. You got a nice district. Mr. Uh, Governor Janklo. Thank you very much. I, if I could, I just, I, I just really have a couple of questions. I, um, we, you, heard, you all heard the testimony of General Gardner, uh, his kind of speech. Uh, which one of his 11 points were the, and I realize maybe you didn't write them all out. Uh, but to the extent you can recall, did any of them trigger your head? Oh, I guess they're up on the board there. Like, geez, he just can't get that done. Is he too optimistic? And if so, with respect to which ones? Go ahead, Mr. Henry. Well, I, I, I think uh, reestablishing town councils and provincial governments that are seen to have genuine legitimacy in the eyes of their communities in that kind of time frame would be very difficult. As opposed you to could establishing. Put, you could put in 
place very temporary kind of structures, but right. I think we ne need to recognize that those kind of political processes will take much more time than something like purchasing the crop or, uh, right. you know, getting the refineries moving so that, you know, you can buy gasoline in, in Baghdad. Mr. Van Bermuth? Uh, I had noted down three points from his list that I thought were probably not as feasible as some of the others, of which installed town councils was one. The second one was the training of the police, getting a police force actually to be credible and operational by June 15th, I think it was. And uh, the third, deeply related to the second, was establishing security. Mr. Biddle? I, I, was, I would echo what, uh, what uh, Rudy had to say. The security issue is, is going to be the most challenging. If we look at Afghanistan, uh, the bombing ended there in December of 2001. It's still a very insecure environment. These are very different countries, obviously, uh, different stages of development. But the fact is, post-conflict settings are extremely uh, difficult to sometimes assess where the threats may co go, uh, where they may come from, and what the circumstances may be. And the issue of policing and creating basic uh, judicial um, procedures and law and order throughout the country is going to be very difficult, and to have that in hand within the next 45 days would uh, seem to me a, be a very great task. Mr. Welling? Yeah, I, I, to, be, to be fair to General Garner, I'm not sure whether he meant these to be in priority order, but if he did, we would probably all have different opinions about whether they should. What the I'm just wondering which be. ones you think yeah. aren't feasible to get done. Um, well, I, I, uh, I don't have anything to add to what my colleagues have said here about feasibility. I would say our perspective, we were surprised that a higher priority and more discussion wasn't given to dealing with the emergency health care needs of the already fragile or endangered populations, cholera being a subset of all that, but there's clearly a much wider range of things. Um, that require uh, immediate assistance from a health care standpoint. Look, if, if I could to all of you, at the risk of being accused of being insensitive, which you know, I don't think I am, but who knows, I, I think everybody understands the concern of a great number of Americans with respect to some of the people on the continent who historically have been somewhat givers, at least to their old colonies or their old areas. And Let's, you know, I'm not into France bashing, but given, given their conduct prior to the war, given the way they treated our Secretary of State, basically sandbagging him, giving the, 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 the documentation that's been found and the business relationships between the last government of Iraq, which I assume people like at least as little as our armed forces over there, um, I, I think all of your organizations can understand the concern about a lot of taxpayers in this country about contributing money into a pool where that country may ha and some others may have any voice at all with respect to what's going on at least in the short term in Iraq. Am, am I making sense? Yeah. I I guess I'd like to say, and I didn't get to answer Mrs. Maloney's question. And I don't want any of you to answer in such a way that yeah. you jeopardize your people. No, I understand. Uh, we don't take any money from the U.S. government. So um, uh, I certainly, we're certainly sensitive to our donors' attitudes with respect to political questions. I'd make two observations. One is, I think most Americans, and I think this is a strength of, of the American people, have the ability to disassociate political things from humanitarian things. And the response that we got in the wake of Iraq, both from individual donors and from corporate donors, suggests to us that they have the ability to make that differentiation. I certainly understand the emotional dynamic that you're describing, that people would like some company in this boat, they'd like some people to be contributing, and they wouldn't be very happy about relieving some of these other countries' obligations of, of bearing their fair share. I think, that's, I think that's perfectly reasonable. But I do think that the American people have the ability to differentiate between those two things. And the rest of you? Well, I, I would just say that um, I think the U.S. government, you know, can choose. We can have a smaller pool of money that we completely control, or we can have a bigger pot of money into which, you know, as many governments as possible will, will be contributing. And, you know, that's in part the debate that will play out in the U.N. Security Council in, in the next week or two. And I think, you know, our perspective is uh, you know, you're, you have to create an international framework that everyone can buy into if you want them to also be, be, be putting their money, um, you know, into that structure. So it, it just comes down to that sort of simple calculus. Yeah, I'm not sure 
their money is that important at this point in time. Right. You that, know, and that's I, a I decision we have to make. Right. That's a value judgment we have to make. But you would understand, given the fact that you, none of you work for a government, you're all independent, you're true to your own ideals of each of your respective organizations, you could understand the concern of taxpayers of this country vis-a-vis -vis contributing to your organizations. Uh, to the extent you may or may not be dealing with others that some consider to may be at least in the short term, if not the long term, uh, people that tried to get some of our soldiers killed and, and tried to make uh, the endeavors that our country embarked on uh, unsuccessful. Any of you disagree with that? <laughs> How uh, dare we? Pardon? How dare we? No, no. Yeah. You, well, I, I think we probably wouldn't want to put it in that purely bilateral context. I think what we're looking at is the multilateral framework that the UN provides and using that as the mechanism to move forward burden sharing and cooperation and building that extra layer of legitimacy so that others uh, build into the process um, in a way that hopefully will make it that much more successful, which is in the U.S.'s interest. If, I mean, that's, I think, the, the if, bottom line. If you could help me, uh, Mr. Biddle, maybe you could help me with something else. I, um, uh, I think you feel pretty strongly that you need to be separated from our government, our military. I accept that. Those are not uh, the same thing. And, and, yeah, no, I know. I, well, yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I mean the military side of our government in Iraq. I apologize. That's what I meant to say. One and two, um, that that you've been very forceful in terms of your testimony that um, that our military should be in a security role because. Anything else they basically do, they're not going to be trusted or they run the risk of not being trusted by substantial numbers of people in Iraq. Yet, at this point in time, at least from the television stuff that we're able to see at times, there's a huge amount of support when the military has been able to work with civilians to get the electricity turned on, watching the military give water to people when it's given out, watching the British troops distributing food. I haven't, you know, I, sure I see the animosity from the mullahs and I see they're able to bring large crowds. It's, I mean, it's in a particular area where no one's ever been friendly to us anyhow. So I don't think that surprises too many people. But my point is, is that what is it that's unique about aid giving now that's different than what we've been able to see over the last several weeks in terms of the enthusiasm for the public for the non-military functions that military people are doing? Well, I think the bottom line is, it's, if I can get to the perception aspect of this, there, oh, there is obviously um, a fear as to what the long-term intentions of the U.S. government uh, may be uh, among some sectors of the population. But isn't that true as long as we have people with uniform there? Well, no matter what their function and role is, whether if they're not giving out food, they're not helping with medical care, they're not restoring services, well, that gets to the second but they're aspect. patrolling the streets, helping, the, helping guard the citizenry, I would think that the public would be far more concerned about that than the former. That well, I, I think that's described. right, and that's where the capacity aspect, uh, I think, comes into play, where on an expertise mm -hmm. level, obviously civilians with expertise in humanitarian, uh, in providing humanitarian uh, assistance are best suited to do, to play that role, and the military is best suited to provide security so that those, can, those actors can go about doing their job. And in fact, I've seen on television certain members of the military saying, you know, let's go back to our primary mission, which is to fight wars and provide a secure environment. So I think there's an understanding. As conflicts end and before you get into a secure enough environment for civilian agencies or private contractors or companies, uh, that are obviously going to be going into Iraq. There is a role for the military in that transitional phase, and, and obviously they've, they're doing a, an outstanding job at, at, that, at, at those tasks at that time. But I think as you go further down the line, you want to actually have specialization in, in, in well, the areas. I, I agree. So I think I everybody think it, agrees with that. I don't think that. we have a huge uh, level of disagreement on that. I, I, I think I may have a slightly different view about this in, in the following respect. Um, I, don't, I don't think anyone is saying it. We're not saying it that it's outside the scope of the um, American government's resources to accomplish this objective. I think what we're saying is that there are important policy issues that arise in the context of assigning responsibility to this that each organization is going to feel differently about. And depending on how you come down on those issues, you may have diminished expert capacity. But what we're saying is, from the perspective of uh, the American people, what's the most efficient way to accomplish these objectives and what's going to be the smart way for the United States government to do it from a longer-term policy standpoint. If we were so convinced that we could do this effectively 
and we were prepared to take the accountability and be judged based on the results, that's clearly our prerogative. I think the question is being raised whether that's both the smart thing to do and the cost-efficient thing to do. And there's another aspect to this which was raised um, about your question, Congressman Shays, about getting to know each other. And there are force protection guidelines that the military has to, uh, to adhere to. And unless those are changed, it's difficult for the military to go out and do some of the things it needs to do at the local community to be able to interface, get to know what's going on, and, and to do their job, especially, obviously, they're armed and they have a different role traditionally in the eyes of a, of a uh, civilian population. And for that reason, it seems uh, appropriate, as my colleague has just said to to allow those uh, different actors to play their uh, their separate uh, separate roles. If if I could just say a couple things, uh, first of all, Care believes that if the military are the only actors in a position to provide life-saving humanitarian assistance to people, they should do it, and we congratulate them for doing that where they have done it in Iraq. So it isn't, you know, a, just a, a turf uh, kind of thing. We're not saying the military should never do that. Saving lives is the most important thing, and if the military are the only people who can do it, then, then they should absolutely do it. You know, the, you know, on this sort of burden-sharing issue, the way I look at it as a taxpayer myself is uh, we, the American taxpayers, can either pick up the whole tab for what is going to be a very expensive banquet in, in Iraq in the coming years, or we can go Dutch with the rest of the, you know, international community. And I would rather go Dutch, and the way to do that is to, you know, bring everyone into a framework that, that makes them feel a sense of, of part ownership of that process. I'd just far rather go Dutch than French. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Maloney has a few questions. I'll have a few, and we will get you out of here. Okay. I, I, I'm your, getting... Your problem, gentlemen, is that you're too interesting and too no, informative. You... <laughs> That's the problem. <clears throat> I, I have uh, constituents and organizations calling me that want to contribute and want to be part of this effort to help Iraq. During 9-11, we had a command central that would uh, pour, you could go to with your resources and they would tell you where to go or they'd tell you what resources they needed. Where can I direct constituents and organizations that are calling me saying they want to be part of this great effort to help Iraq? Where do they go? Where do we direct them? I would say to each of these organizations' websites, you, in many cases, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can give online, you can find out how to volunteer. There's a wealth of information available. Uh, but I, I think uh, they want to be plugged in, I think, into the whole U.S. effort, not particularly a, an organization. And who's coordinating it? USAID? Uh, would you direct them to USAID? I don't know. Anyway. Uh, I mean, that most of our organizations are, are, if not all, are members of Interaction, which is the biggest umbrella of international agencies, and they have a list of all of the member agencies doing work in Iraq, and, you know, you can get, you know, to their website and from That's their helpful. website to ours. That's helpful. One of the most troubling things that you've said to me is that there is nowhere to call for security. And if you don't have security, you don't really have a society because society cannot function if people are afraid to walk out of their homes to buy food or go to school. And we have to restore security before we can really provide adequate health care or aid to our children or food or whatever. So uh, what is your idea of how we should do that? Should we, uh, we, we have to, what is your idea of how, should we bring in an international force uh, should it be the U.S. military? Should it be a funded Iraqi group? How do we make this happen? Well, that under the Geneva Conventions, that's the responsibility of the occupying power to find out and determine way, the best ways to do that. Um, there are obviously there are various options that might be available to them, internationalizing the peacekeeping efforts to increase the number of forces on the ground or bring in uh, more coalition forces, uh, international constabulary force to support police training and expand the, uh, uh, the level of security across the country, changing the, uh, the, uh, the uh, force protection guidelines of the, uh, of the, Ameri of the coalition forces 
force us to be able to do more creative things on a security measure. Uh, we're not experts on this. These are mm -hmm. just ideas and things that we've seen in other settings around the world. But uh, the bottom line is, is that it is a responsibility of the of the occupying power to, to develop approaches to, to meet this need. And I do think it pervades um, all the aspects that we've described of, of our work uh, in the field. Um, particularly, uh, there was a report in the New York Times today that one of the issues in addressing cholera right now is the fact that the health system is so uh, affected by the security environment that uh, hospitals are under-equipped, uh, staff are scared to go um, into the hospitals, that they've had to send the cholera tests up to Kuwait to have them checked. So it's not just a question mm -hmm. of the sewage and the electricity mm -hmm. and, the, and the mechanized aspects of addressing this in an urban environment. It's also the fact that uh, you can't even address the, health, the specific health intervention for a given case uh, because of the environment in the country right now. And, and granted, there have been challenges uh, in, in, in the case of, of, of cholera in the country over the last 12 years, but usually the health system was there to identify cases and respond to it quickly. So preventing a cholera outbreak is that is going to be that much more difficult as a result of that. In, in conclusion, I'm concerned very much about the economic burden uh, to America. Um, uh, we have many problems here at home in our own schools and our own uh, health care delivery system. And I agree with Mr. Henry that we should go Dutch, that we should uh, uh, get as much help as we can. And one obvious place is the, is the frozen Iraqi assets, I, I believe uh, 1.7 billion in our own country. And they are probably assets from the Saddam Hussein government in uh, many countries around the world. And one approach would be to freeze that money and return it to the Iraqi people in terms of hospitals, teachers, schools, um, sanitation and, and uh, clean water systems. And I wondered uh, what your comments would be on that. Well, by all means, uh, what we have to remember is that Iraq not only has some assets that can be seized, they have massive debts. And that is probably the biggest financial problem that's going to have to be sorted out in the years to come is how can we pay for the reconstruction of Iraq while, you know, also allowing Iraq to overcome its huge debt burden. Okay. Thank you. Thank any, you. Any other comments on freezing Iraqi assets in foreign countries? And let, let me uh, just finish up here real quick. and. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not asking for you to comment if you don't have a, a, a particular reaction, but I want you to react to anything General Garner said or Green, Mr. Green or Mr. Garvelink said. You sat here all day long since two plus, and uh, was there anything that General Garner said you want to put on the record either being reacting positively or negatively or to what Mr. Green or Mr. Garvelink said, any of you? Yes. Uh, just for starters, uh, I was a little bit surprised when uh, General Garner said there was no humanitarian crisis in Iraq. And he then went on to describe the conditions that he just observed in Basra, of uh, sewage flowing through the streets, uh, hospitals that weren't functioning very well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there was a pre-existing humanitarian crisis in Iraq before the war happened, and I think that crisis in some areas has only been exacerbated as the health systems, et cetera, have been looted and savaged and what have you. So uh, I, I would take issue with that statement. Okay. Uh, any other comment that any of them said that you'd like to, to speak about? Well, as I've already noted, I think uh, Mr. Garvelink's suggestion that things aren't so bad in the health care system, I, I, I just don't accept as, as being an accurate statement of the current situation in Iraq. Okay. And I would just say that General Garner's timeline might be a bit optimistic uh, on, on the number of variety of issues that need to be addressed during that shorter period. Well, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to add um, that I think the, um, the point that you made earlier is if you have someone in your office who you want to be responsible for something so you can go to one place and give credit if it succeeds or one place to understand why it doesn't, if it didn't, was manifest in some of the discussion that we had here today with people be being responsible for different parts of the puzzle and, and not necessarily being able to address questions that if you had someone who had primary responsibility is a central point of control here. Some of the questions that, that were presented would have been able, would have been answered. Yeah. Now, I don't want this last question to take five minutes to answer, but I, I, I would like someone to 
define success and then tell me if we are going to succeed. Mr. Biddle, well, you, you, your mouth yeah, started to I, move first. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'll take it in the short term. Yeah. Um, I think one of the reasons all of us have focused on the security issue is we're worried about losing the hearts and minds of the Iraqi people. Uh, they lived under uh, 12 uh, or 25 years of a brutal dictatorship. Uh, they've suffered through a number of wars, uh, repression of minorities and dissidents. Um, they've uh, had uh, a very challenging time. Uh, and the opportunity now to create a, uh, a better society, obviously, uh, through um, the removal of Saddam Hussein means that you need to touch people at their very core existence, which means being able to help them achieve some of their uh, particular needs in the near term. So health care, uh, education for children, a secure environment to live in, and obviously the transition to a governing process at the local uh, and provincial uh, and national level. But in the near term, I think that really means the law and order, secure environment, and then beginning to address these critical services, health, water, uh, education and of course the food issue could become uh, a challenging one uh, in the near term as well and making sure that the oil for food program distribution process is successful in, in, keep, in meeting the needs of the population in the near term. I would say that's going to determine the success over the next um, you know six months or so. So security um, on the one hand and uh, basic human needs as you move to the larger reconstruction, transitional governance, uh, larger issues that will obviously take some time. But I think those two, those two aspects, and they go hand in hand uh, together. Anybody else want to make a comment? Yes. I, I go back to your observations of your visit to uh, Iraq not very long ago and what it meant to see it as opposed to read about it. And I think for me, uh, success is going to be when, uh, when I visit Iraq and see kids going to school in the morning. Uh, see women being able to go out to market, uh, see people milling about the streets in a casual way in the evenings, see storefronts opening up, uh, and be able to travel from town to town without going in a convoy. That's going to be success. That's very interesting. Thank you. Mr. I, mean, I saw you, Mr. Biddle, nod your head as well. <laughs> no, that was, it was more eloquently put in terms of the image he created. So you know I, what? But I, you I, I laud him for that. <laughs> well, I, but you started it. Yeah. Well. And so you gave him time to think. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very important thing. Have time to think. Yeah. Uh, I, Your mic just went off. I think that um, uh, success will be defined both for the Iraqi people in terms of quality of life, which is better than the quality of life that they had prior to the war, so that not only do we need to meet the standard of what existed there before, but obviously our aspiration is to do something substantially better. And I personally think there's no question that we'll succeed because I think that the, I think the American people have been engaged in this and understand that not only is it a great opportunity, but it's part of our obligation in undertaking this in the first instance. Should we end on that positive note? You all have been a wonderful uh, panel. Mr. Andrew, you wanted to say something. Well, no, I, I, I just wanted to say that I think we will know that we've achieved success when the majority of the Iraqi people say that their lives are better than they were before, not just before the war, but before this long nightmare that they've been living through. Right. And do you think we are going to succeed? I, thi I think we can succeed if we're prepared to commit the resources and stay the course. Right. And based on what you've said, we have done in Afghanistan, that would not be a positive model for us. We think more would need to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I, I, I think all of you are a credit to your organization, and uh, I think very highly of each of your organizations, in part by the presentation that you all have made today. And I thank you very much for participating in this very, I think, very educational and helpful hearing. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, the record will remain open uh, to provide uh, for two weeks to provide uh, information or documents. And with that, we will adjourn this hearing. Thank you.
Coming up here on C-SPAN 2, the president of South Korea talks about his country's relationship with the U.S. After that, President Bush on the economy and the recent...